Good morning. Milady, may I please call Sir Oliver Letwin? I do solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm, declare and affirm that, the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, shall be the, truth, the, whole truth the whole truth, and nothing but the, and truth. Nothing but the truth. Could you please give the inquiry your name? Uh, Oliver Letwin. Thank you very much for attending today before the inquiry. Um, Sir Oliver, uh, as you give evidence, could you please remind yourself to, to speak clearly into the microphone in front of you and keep your voice up so that we may all hear what you have to say? If I ask you a question which is not clear, don't hesitate to, to ask uh, me to repeat it, and um, there will probably be a break mid-evidence during the course of the morning. You provided a, a statement to this inquiry dated the 24th of April 2023. Could we have that please on the screen? 177810, thank you. The first page is a page one there. If we go to page 16, we should see your statement of truth at the end um, and you, in fact, signed it on the 24th of April. And, and the contents of that statement are true. My lady, may that please be published? Certainly. Um, so, Oliver, I'd like to commence, if I may, about asking you some questions about the functions that you performed whilst you held the post of Minister for Government Policy between May 2010 and July 2016 and as Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster between July 2014 and July 2016. Essentially, you held the resilience portfolio whilst you held both those ministerial posts. Could you tell us, please, something about that portfolio, why it was divided between those ministerial posts, and what the difference was in those ministerial posts? Um, yes, uh, I should clarify that I um, didn't become uh, responsible specifically for resilience until some point, which I can't exactly remember, but late-ish, I think, in 2011. So, as I said in my statement, it's from 2011 to 2016 that I was uh, specifically involved. Um, and that was in the context of... Um, a rather wide-ranging and unusual role, um, uh, which began uh, by my taking a large part in the um, formation of the coalition and the negotiation of the coalition with our Liberal Democrat colleagues, and then in the drafting of the programme for government, um, which came out of the two manifestos, and then in uh, the succeeding uh, five years of 2011, uh, sorry, 2010 to 2015, the years of the coalition, uh, um, absolutely endless discussions with counterparts in uh, Liberal Democrat um, cabinet um, to keep the show on the road and keep resolving issues. Uh, I was also responsible for monitoring the implementation uh, across the field of our program for government uh, and for devising the second program for government that came along uh, sort of halfway through the coalition and for sitting on all cabinet committees uh, across the board in order to have a, a view of policy and where it was going and how it connected with the implementation and whether there were going to be coalition issues arising from it. So right. it was a, a broad portfolio a broad within portfolio. which resilience was therefore a relatively small part, which uh, has led me to reflect, as you may wish to discuss later, that actually there really ought to be a minister solely devoted to resilience at a senior level. Well, I was going to ask you, may we take it from the fact that whilst you were focusing on resilience as part of a wider portfolio of, of um, obligations, um, there was no minister, and there has never been at any time, a minister whose sole responsibility is emergency preparedness, resilience, response, civil emergencies? There hasn't, as far as I'm aware. 
and uh, uh, I think that that is an error. Uh, I came to that view very gradually, uh, but by the end of my time, I was pretty convinced that we ought to move, and had I remained in situ, I would have tried, therefore, to move to a model where somebody took that position. If you'll allow me, I think I should add three other points. One, there's a tendency to learn that lesson in the wrong way. Uh, the appointment of a junior minister um, will achieve nothing, I think, in this domain. It would have to be somebody who's senior and who's close to the prime minister in order to get things done, because this, in the end, is not about um, uh, elegant committee minutes and discussions. It's about pursuing things to the end and trying to find out whether things have actually happened and whether they're going to work. And that requires someone senior and close to the centre of government to get prime ministerial authority behind things, because that's the way things happen in government. The second point I want to make is that uh, uh, whilst I think that, that there needs to be a group of people who are devoted exclusively to resilience in the sense of preparedness, and they probably need to be separate from a group of people who are ready to service and handle emergencies as they arise, the minister, in my view, needs to fulfill both of the roles that I was fulfilling very part-time, full-time, but both of them simultaneously. You learn a lot when you're dealing even with minor crises about how to prepare for other crises, including complicated and major ones. And I think it's by being present in, during, and taking some responsibility for the handling of crises that you learn most about how to prepare for them. So I would keep those two things together. That was the one good feature of my role, that because I was involved in dealing with flooding, with Ebola, with a whole series of um, fuel tanker problems and so on. Uh, at least I, I knew some of the problems that arose when you were facing a real crisis when I was trying to pursue my resilience review. And the final point I'd make is this, and I, I find it difficult to uh, explain this briefly and articulately, so forgive me if I'm not as articulate as I should be, but uh, there's all the difference in the world between discovering that something is the case, shall we say, that the... Um, uh, the diesel available for uh, backup in local authorities is all very well for the local authority vans which run on diesel, but um, not much use for the care responders who use petrol, uh, and actually getting to the point where there is petrol available. Uh, and you don't do that by um, uh, attending to it on Monday and then um, waiting a long time. You have to attend to it on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday. And that really is very difficult to do if you're doing an awful lot of other things. I tried to do it in the fields that I preoccupy myself with in resilience, but I'm very conscious that I didn't have enough time to do as much as I should have done. That's extremely helpful, thank you. May we take it from what you've told us, Sir Oliver, then, that the issue of resilience of preparedness and, and perhaps also uh, some of the other areas involving civil contingencies such as the risk of cyber attack and so on and so forth was not a formal area which was assigned if you like to one or other of the ministerial positions that you held it, it was a it was a function or a post or an area that you grew that that you devoted attention to and, and which perhaps took up a larger amount of your time. It wasn't a formal policy area for which you took formal responsibility by virtue of one or other of those ministerial posts. That's correct. All right. Um, could you just help us, please, with the, the differences between the various ministerial positions to which you've made reference? Um, it, is the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster a more senior ministerial post than, for example, the Minister for the Cabinet Office? The Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster is like the Holy Roman Empire, neither Holy nor Roman nor Empire, uh, neither a Chancellor nor much of a Duchy, uh, and um, it's uh, just an honorific, um, uh, an ancient honorific. Um, a minuscule proportion of my time, perhaps um, an hour a month, was spent on Duchy of Lancaster business. Um, and that will be the same for any um, chancellor. There's a perfectly well-oiled machine that looks after the Queen's lands in Lancaster and does not need to preoccupy a minister. Um, 
my real role was as so-called Minister for Government Policy, and actually, really, under that, I was simply a jack of all trades, a, a Mr. Fixit. I did what it was that the Prime Minister uh, wanted done, um, and that was holding the coalition together, making sure that our programme for government was implemented, and trying to fix crises as they arose. It was really out of the third, the fixing crises as they arose, role that I slipped into resilience and became progressively, as I learned about it, more and more concerned about our state of resilience or lack of it, and became more and more involved in it, and eventually decided that really I ought to, or somebody ought to, spend their entire time doing it. Whilst you were a minister, was there a position known as Minister of Implementation? We've heard evidence that uh, at, at some point there was the creation of such a post, and um, Oliver Dowden, I think, was the Minister for Implementation in 2018 and 2019, but there was no such post in, in existence when you were a minister, was there? During the coalition, uh, Danny Alexander, my Liberal Democrat counterpart and I were effectively joint ministers for implementation. Our job was to make sure that the coalition program was implemented. And in a coalition, of course, that's a matter of contractual obligation. It's not just a matter of will or desire. Uh, so it was vitally important to the sustaining of the coalition that we, we were confident that that program was being implemented. All ministers, by definition, start off, by and large, as amateurs. Um, did, to what extent did you have to learn on the job in relation to the field of emergency preparedness, resilience and response? Completely. Uh, I, I think I can accurately say that when I began, it was entirely new to me. Um, I'd been in opposition Shadow Home Secretary, for example, so I had seen um, uh, some of the issues arise, but that's a whole different thing from actually trying to deal with crises and trying to deal with preparation. It was when I actually sat in the Cobra room and discovered that we were not properly prepared to deal with a fuel tanker crisis or to avert it, discovered that the um, Civil Contingencies Act emergency powers were powers for having an emergency rather than preventing one, and uh, discovered that it was only through the army that I could actually get someone to organize for uh, the tankers to arrive at the petrol stations in order to prevent the strike being effective and thereby ultimately prevent the strike, that I discovered that there was a whole set of problems here I knew nothing about, and that's when I began to learn about them. And is one of the more difficult features of being a minister concerned with emergency preparedness, resilience and response, that, that you're necessarily having to deal not just with the arcane world of policy and guidance and the general application of principles, but with, to use a word that we've seen um, many references to, Oper operationalization, that is to say, having to respond to crises and to civil emergencies and, and to have to take practical operational decisions for, for which perhaps one may not be terribly well suited or, or, or trained. Yes, I, I, I mean, first of all, in answer to that, I should say I don't think this is an area where policy matters terribly. Policy matters where there are disagreements about the direction in which some aspect of the country's affairs should go, and uh, your government has a, a view, and then it seeks to find means of fulfilling that. Uh, there are no disagreements here uh, that I'm aware of right across the political spectrum. We all want to prevent emergencies arising. We want to minimize their impact when they do arise. This is not an, an issue for argument and debate and policy. Uh, there's only one policy, which is minimise emergencies and make, them, make ourselves as resilient to them as we can. It's all about the operations. It's all about finding out what actually is there on the ground. It's all very well having committees and structures and uh, guidance documents, and these can come out of your ears without actually knowing that you've got the right things there. You, know, you, you can't, you can have a, a guidance manual about PPE, but if there's no PPE there, it, it won't be available. To, to what extent, whilst you were a minister, were documents such as the 2011 influenza pandemic strategy or the risk assessment protocols and guidance brought to your attention? Well, they weren't, but for a reason which I've described in my uh, we'll, come to, we'll come in a moment sorry, to, to your request that there be a number of reviews and, and to what the response was. But, but in order to gain some understanding of, of the level 
to which you had to descend in terms of looking at the guidance and the policy documentation and the protocols and the approaches, the, 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 the written strategic material relating to how to respond to a crisis, was that the sort of material which would find itself to ministerial level? Um, typically, uh, it did arrive uh, for blessing at the end of a very long uh, bureaucratic process that had led to its formulation. But, but in the areas that I was focusing on, as I've explained in the statement, I was not focusing on pandemic flu because I was advised that that was already being very well dealt with and I delegated that therefore to Clay Smith, who may want to come back to that. It's a matter of regret on my part. But um, uh, in the areas I was delving into proactively, the whole of our critical national infrastructure, which I believed increasingly and still believe is wildly under resilient, uh, I was not spending time reading guidance documents and policy documents. I was spending time with people who were running the telecom system, the um, uh, grid, the uh, district network operators, the ports, the airports, the people who ran the supply chains for critical chemicals and so on, and, and spending hours with them hour after hour in an inquisitorial mode, rather as you're doing with me now, to try to find out whether, rather than all the documents and guidance, they actually had the things in place that needed to be in place to make them resilient. So how does the system work in a ministerial office, Sir Oliver, in relation to the, the signing off, if you like, of important strategies, policies or, or guidance? So take, for example, during your time um, in office, there would have been and there were produced a number of risk assessments, generally biannually, and those risk assessments would be drawn up by reference to particular, particular and different risks, and they would be revised and considered by any number of government departments, by external advisers, by chief scientific advisers, by chief medical officers in relation to health risks, and so on and so forth. That biannual risk assessment would then come to you as the minister, and you would be presented with it, and, and presumably you would be asked to give your assent to its promulgation. Yes, uh, but uh, your description is accurate. That's to say, I, was aware, I didn't know the details, but I was aware that each one of these risk assessments had been through this awesome process you described with any number of experts. And I was, of course, an entire amateur. I mean, I know nothing about um, uh, the, the science of the spread of diseases or the science of almost any of the other things that might have come onto the risk register. Uh, and nor was I expected to be an expert in the science or the uh, professional judgments. So it was, of course, absurd to suppose that I could counteract or, or um, uh, uh, overrule all these experts. Or even be alive to, to the particularly difficult doctrinal or practical issues which underpin the particular document with which you were being presented. Well, I think that I should have said to myself, in retrospect, um, not are all these experts wrong, but have they asked the right questions? Because that is something an amateur can do. Perhaps only an amateur can do that, in the sense you have to be outside the system, I think, to a degree, to, to be able to ask that question. And that's why I came to the conclusion gradually that we needed a sort of red team that, that was going to ask the right questions, because I didn't even know enough to ask the right questions or to know whether they'd ask the right questions. I, I, I think in the case of the critical national infrastructure, by the end, I got close enough to the subject, so that although obviously I can't run the electricity system and I don't know how the telecommunication systems operates as an engineer does, I did know what questions to ask by the end, because I'd asked so many questions and seen so many answers that I'd begun to suspect the things I wasn't being told. You can't do that for, for areas that you're not deeply involved in. Emergencies are, by definition, of course, not business as usual. Is there a case, therefore, for a formal system of training of those ministers who are tasked with a heavy obligation of dealing with civil emergencies? Not only a, a case, I think an overwhelming case, uh, but that's just part of a much wider need for training, which emerges, I think, extraordinarily from all the papers that you've asked me to review. and. 
which I got the sense of gradually anyway, and why I'm so very glad to see in the, uh, the resilience framework document the government has now produced that there is to be an academy. I hope that rather than just dealing with how to produce guidance and how to write minutes and so on, will actually be about how to handle emergencies and therefore how to exercise for emergencies and therefore how to prepare for emergencies to make sure that, that you can actually handle them effectively. And does that include, therefore, by way of exercise or, or, or training, um, enabling ministers to be able to better discharge the functions yes. imposed upon them? Yes. But can I add one thing? Because I, I hope, um, Milady, that this inquiry will, will, will make this point, because I think it's incredibly important. If you're a minister responsible for anything, a force your eye resilience, but even um, you know, really important things like health, defence, for six months. You could have training for the first two months, but by the time you've finished your training, you've practically finished your job. Um, if you're a, a, an official that uh, does a, a job that's related to the crucial interests of the United Kingdom for 18 months, and you have training, which usually takes six months to arrange and you know, six months to conduct, Again, you, you, by the time you know, you're off. Uh, I, by the end of my time working on these things for uh, five years, uh, with the exception of one or two people in the Civil Contingency Secretariat who were continuing their role there and knew uh, an awful lot, I kept on coming across officials who knew less than I did as an amateur, me as the amateur, because they'd actually been in post for next to no time whatsoever. So it isn't just a question of training. It's a question of training and having a system that keeps both ministers and officials in post long enough so they can use the training. Is that a, another way of saying that the, the revolving door aspect of some ministerial appointments and official appointments tends to undermine experience efficacy and the ability of ministers and officials to be able to do the job with which they're tasked? I strongly believe that it does. It, I think that's true as a general proposition, but we're not here to discuss the whole of British government. In this crucial respect, I think having a minister responsible who's there right the way through a government and with officials who are committed to it from beginning to end and, and with luck longer than that in their careers is really critical to success. So Oliver, can I just ask, you described the revolving door, and I think we're all familiar with it across government. Is that because you think there is a trend to have a revolving door with whatever government, whatever political hue, or because there is a revolving door in this particular area because it isn't considered to be a good career stop? I think probably both, my lady. Uh, I, I, I'm pretty certain that the entire structure of the civil service means that you can't really make progress in a career without going through endless different jobs one after another, which I regard as a disaster for the country, particularly disastrous in the case of things that have very long lead times and where learning from experience is critical. Um, and as to ministers, um, of course the exigencies of our parliamentary democratic system make it difficult to maintain continuity. In, in every post. But in this particular domain, if we were really taking it with the seriousness we need to take it, I think we would have people who were there right through. And I, I thought one of the very good things about the way that David Cameron ran this aspect of our affairs was that I was allowed at least to learn, so that by the end I really did know much more than at the beginning. Sir Oliver, in your witness statement, you, you make reference to a specialist committee called the National Security Council Threats, Hazards, Resilience and Contingencies Committee, which we believe what was commenced around the time, I think, that you became Minister for Government Policy. But it was a committee um, which was very much within your brief because you and David Cameron agreed that there ought to be a specialist unit in the Cabinet Office which would deal with matters such as horizon scanning, which would feed into that committee. <coughs> Can you recall whether or not the Cabinet subcommittee structure gave 
as much weight to the issue of hazards and civil emergencies as it did to the issue of threats, national security threats of the type, I, I don't know, terrorist outrages, CBRNE um, attacks, the, the behavior of rogue states, and so on and so forth. Was there equality, do you believe, between the two systems? Or, or was the system that dealt with hazards crowded out to some extent by the focus on threats? I think there is always a danger um, uh, that um, threats are um, uh, more, more considered in Whitehall than hazards um, because there's a huge apparatus dealing with threat. Um, MOD, the Foreign Office, the agencies, um, security agencies, uh, the National Security Advisor, you know, on and on. Whereas um, there hasn't been up till now, though I hope there now will be with the Head of Resilience and, and if the man Alexander suggestions for a, um, an integrated management system were adopted or indeed very similar to what the Rycroft Review I now see recommended in 22, maybe we could, we could create, a, a, if not equivalent, at least a, a, a counterbalancing power in Whitehall pushing for consideration of, of things that aren't threats. Uh, so I think the answer to your question is that there w it was overbalanced towards threats. But uh, may I just point out something else which gets lost in the uh, dichotomy threat hazard? Actually, for most of our fellow citizens, for people who were bereaved in COVID or people who were affected by um, any of the other disasters which have afflicted our nation over many uh, decades and centuries, actually it's the impacts that count and not the causes. And uh, whether a biological agent is released by nature or by uh, a, a state actor or a non-state actor or terrorist, whether the whole of our critical national infrastructure goes down because there's uh, space weather or because there's a, a, a cyber attack by a malicious uh, party, it doesn't matter from the point of view of the way we prepare to respond and the response we exhibit. Uh, it's the impact that we need to deal with on behalf of our people, in particular the most vulnerable people, the people who are vulnerable to that impact. And unless you focus on impacts, you can't focus on the right vulnerabilities because it's not the cause that causes some people to be more vulnerable than others. It's the impact that causes some people to be more vulnerable to others. Old people may be more vulnerable to some impacts, young people to others, and so on. So it's, it's not so, I mean, although I do think it's important to separate between threats and hazards because of this overbalancing towards preoccupation with threats because of the structure of government and the weight of the money. Actually, I think the most important shift to achieve is a shift from focusing on causes to shift uh, to a focus on impacts and dealing with impacts and preparing to deal with impacts and minimizing impacts and particularly minimizing impacts for the most vulnerable people in relation to that impact. Does it follow from what you said, Sir Oliver, that going forward, the, the system for the assessment of risk, for the consideration of response, for the development of resilience needs in a general sense to focus more on impact as opposed to likelihood or cause. Absolutely, and you introduce a, an important element that I hadn't mentioned, which is this question of likelihood. Um, I, I have great respect uh, both for economists and for the Treasury, uh, genuinely, it's not a, a snide remark, but there's a terrible danger in treasuries the world over and amongst economists the world over that they're fixated with discount rates and probabilities. So if event X has a low, very low probability of occurring and is likely to occur a long time away, when you multiply the probability low by the discount rate high, you come to the answer that it's not worth worrying about it compared to things which are right in front of your nose. And this is a very bad mistake because events with huge impacts that are very unlikely and may not occur for many years, if they do occur, will nevertheless have huge impacts. 
And as we've discovered, those are, in every sense, human terms and economic terms, incredibly costly. So uh, I think it's vital not only that we focus on impacts, but that we focus on major impacts. That isn't to say we should ignore the minor ones, but actually I think we're pretty good at handling the minor ones. It's the major ones that we're not properly prepared for. Um, Milady has procured a copy of a book called Apocalypse How, found, I think, in all good bookshops, but it, it's, it's your book. D do you say in your book that there has been a failure by virtue of over-reliance on statistics and probabilities, that the system should focus remorselessly on worst-case scenarios without worrying in the least about how likely these are to occur. This ought to be obvious, but it will seem quite counterintuitive in any established bureaucracy, because bureaucracies are used not only to cost-benefit analysis of the, th of the sort that is so destructive of full-back option planning, but also to the allied pursuit of probability analysis. So are you saying, Sir Oliver, that the danger, and, and it is a trap, of course, into which the, the country fell, is of being unprepared for an event which, although it may be less likely, may have colossal impact? Yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, my great regret about not having focused on um, pandemic flu because I was advised it was being well looked after is not actually about pandemic flu. I might or might not have been able to improve preparedness for pandemic flu, but that it might have occurred to me if I had focused on that, that despite the fact that all the scientists had concluded, and no doubt they were right, uh, that there was a very tiny probability by comparison with the probability of pandemic flu of some other catastrophic uh, pathogen. Uh, I, I, it might have occurred to me to say, well, okay, there's a tiny probability, but as a matter of fact, can we, for a tiny amount of money, prepare properly to deal with it in advance? Um, and that would be the right question to ask. Now, you made reference a few moments ago to the reviews that uh, you ordered be carried out whilst you were a minister. Uh, and you made reference, in fact, to your junior ministerial colleague, Chloe Smith, MP. C could we have, please, on the screen, 13404? At page one. The, this is a, a memo dated the 18th of January 2012, copied to a number of people, including um, your private secretary, as well as the private secretary to Francis Maud MP and a, and a number of senior officials. Uh, and it's headed Minister for Political and Constitutional Reform, Cabinet Office, briefing for ministerial review of the UK's resilience to pandemic influenza. Uh, and you will see that the memo concerns a prospective meeting with Anna Subri MP to review the UK's resilience to pandemic influenza. If you look at page three, please, paragraph 12. You and Oliver Letwin will be writing to the Prime Minister with your findings. We'll discuss with you when and what form this takes, but this may be some months from now. Consequently, if you have particular concerns with the adequacy of existing plans or the Department of Health's knowledge of them, we suggest you use the meeting to commission the Department of Health to update you on progress in a few months. So is this a memo, in fact, to your ministerial colleague? But it concerns, does it not, the series of reviews that you instructed be done into various aspects of civil contingencies? Well, we should distinguish. Um, uh, th there were um, those areas that I didn't commission, I undertook the review. Uh, so with uh, the critical national infrastructure. I didn't have meetings with other departments uh, of the sort that's represented here. Uh, I spent, as I say, many, many hours drilling down into the detail with the actual people operating the systems in question. Uh, because my officials in the Civil Contingency Secretariat uh, 
at the very beginning said to me, this is the area of our national life that we think is least well prepared. And so I, that, I didn't have an infinite amount of time at my disposal. I decided to focus on that and drill down into it. So I didn't ask other people to do that. I did that very personally, right. sat there hour after hour. Then, of course, there was all the rest of, of our planning. Pandemic influenza, yes, but also all the sectors. The, uh, there's another memorandum in, in the uh, dossier here, uh, which is similar to this, but relates to the care sector, for example. In all of those sectors, uh, I asked Chloe Smith uh, to, uh, to hold a series of much less detailed uh, meetings, assuming that the departments in question under the lead government department model, which we may want to discuss in a moment, I'm not a great believer in, but nevertheless, uh, would, would be concerned with preparations in those sectors, and her job was simply to interrogate them and make sure that they were on the job. All right. Could we please have a look at page six of this document, that there's a reference to uh, maybe back one page. Thank you very much. In the middle of the page, there is this heading, yes. UK surveillance of other diseases with pandemic potential, so that is to say non-influenza diseases. Yes. The applicability of pandemic influenza planning to other scenarios is good and continues to develop. Obviously, the passage of time demonstrated that that was not an entirely accurate prognosis. This field of pandemic influenza planning and planning for other scenarios, was that one of the areas in which you were able yourself to carry out a review? No. Now you're shaking your head for the transcript. I'm sorry, of no, it. Can you say it was, no. It was not. I was advised, as I say, that that was under good control, as reflected in this uh, official briefing, and therefore I made the mistake of not looking into it myself. C can you, play. could you please tell my lady a little bit more about the way in which you asked whether this was an area which required your personal attention and how the response came back to the effect that this was an area in which we were particularly well prepared and therefore did not require your personal assistance. Yes, and incidentally, I, 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 mean, I will, of course, answer that. I, I should start by saying I don't exonerate myself because actually I probably should just have paid no attention whatsoever to this advice. Um, nevertheless, I did. What happened was this. When I took on the job, it was, as I say, in the context of the fuel tanker crisis, and I was dealing with things minute by minute. When I had time to draw breath and to consider what had happened during that uncrisis, because we'd managed to avert it, uh, and what it showed about lack of resilience planning, I thought I, I really should begin a set of systematic reviews to find out whether there were other areas, like fuel delivery, where we were not well prepared for a crisis. And uh, so I asked the CCS, how should we do this and what, what uh, is that a, a reference to oh, the civil contingency secretary? The civil contingency secretary. secretary, I'm very sorry. Um, and uh, I was, of course, aware that the National Risk uh, Register or the National Security Risk Assessment or you know whichever of these are, uh, uh, documents one refers to put pandemic flu high uh, both on impact and on probability. So it was an obvious thing to put high on my review. And I said to them, perhaps we should begin with this. And they said, Minister, that would be a mistake because uh, there's going to be a full exercise, which became, I think, exercise Cygnus. Indeed. Uh, there is already a desktop uh, uh, exercise plan, which I think was called Cygnet. Cygnet. Uh, there is an indefinite amount of attention being paid to this by the government uh, chief scientist and his uh, team, uh, which I think was true. Uh, there is a great deal of attention focused on it from the chief medical officer, which I think was true as well. Uh, and uh, it's a risk which is, uh, I hate to use this word, but uh, it was used frequently in Whitehall, owned by uh, the Department of Health. And uh, it's you'll really just be reinventing the wheel. Why don't you focus on critical national infrastructure, which is much less well uh, investigated? And I followed that advice. Uh, as I say, actually, it's, it, it, it's absolutely not an excuse for a minister, alas, because you can always ask 
uh, the, the, the following question. You don't have to, to accept the advice. You can say, well, okay, I, I, I hear that advice, but actually I still would like to look at it, and that is actually what I should have done, and it's a matter of lasting regret. I didn't, but I didn't. And therefore, Sir Oliver, does it follow from that that between the time when you asked that question and the time that you left ministerial office, so essentially 2011 to 2016, there was no effective, or at least no effective, detailed ministerial consideration of the area of pandemic influenza planning or associated non-influenza pathogenic planning. This was an area which you yourself played no role in supervising. The last part of your question is absolutely right. I, myself, did not. I just checked from time to time with the chief scientist and the chief medical officer that they were content it was progressing and had Chloe Smith doing what you see from these documents. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so, so far as that part of your question is concerned, therefore, the answer is yes. But uh, it doesn't follow from that there were no other ministers who were dealing with it in detail. Of course, the, the health department contained ministers who were dealing with it, as I understand, in detail. You're talking here, I but suppose, just the about minister. the Cabinet Office. You were the Minister for Resilience, Preparedness, and, yes. in a broad sense, civil contingencies. Yes. Yes. Could we have, please, 13415 13, on the screen and at page 2? Thank you. This is a, a memo dated the 28th of January 2013. It's a memo from the Civil Contingency Secretariat, uh, and it concerns the review of UK resilience planning, which, which was being conducted by, but not, as you've described, by you. At the top of the page, there is a reference to um, Perhaps we could go back one page. Actually, it might be a little easier. And then down to the bottom of the page. On the issue of countermeasures for pandemics, the challenges of ensuring a proportionate response early on in a pandemic when knowledge of the virus was limited were noted. And then this right at the bottom of the page, MPCR questioned whether the stockpiles of countermeasures provided protection. And then over the page. Perhaps you can go to the top of the page. Oh, oh yes, we are, we are at the top of the page. From yeah. other non-influenza pandemic disease risks. So the, the issue is plainly raised there as to whether mm -hmm. or not the stockpiles for influenza pandemic would be sufficient for other non-influenza pandemic disease risks. Was that a, a question or an issue which was ever brought specifically to your attention? No. Uh, it, I obviously received both the briefing and the um, uh, account of the meetings that um, Chloe Smith had, so I will have seen these, these documents. Um, uh, and uh, I, uh, to that extent, it was brought to my attention, and it looked as though, as you can see from these documents, there was a consensus in uh, the Department of Health and the Health Protection Agency that um, uh, this was... Um, uh, I don't know how to put this uh, so ludicrous in retrospect, but um, under control. The evidence may show, uh, it's a matter entirely for my lady, that, that there were a number of strategic flaws in the United Kingdom's approach to pandemic planning, as it turns out. You've mentioned one of them already in your witness statement, a long-standing bias in favour of influenza, and diseases that had already occurred, in particular the, the 1918 H1N1 Spanish flu pandemic. There may also have been a, a failure to appreciate properly that viruses were unpredictable with variable characteristics and therefore 
the next pandemic may well very well may very well not be an influenza pandemic but be a non-influenza viral respiratory pandemic with just as catastrophic consequences because of high transmissibility and deadly severity. And there also appears to, in the risk assessment process to be a, a failure to consider multiple scenarios. Um, there was an approach by which there was a cause agnostic approach, that is to say, a failure to consider the specific nature of a possible future pandemic. And, and because the worst case scenario was focused on, that there may have been a tendency to stop and think, well, does there really have to be 820,000 deaths in the worst case scenario for a pandemic influenza? What about trying to stop it before it gets that bad? So preventing the terrible consequences from ensuing as opposed to dealing with the terrible consequences once they have ensued. Those are all aspects of, of arguably a strategic failure to think through the issues. You've referred in your witness statement to the need, therefore, for group think to be eradicated, to be challenged, for red teams to be put into place to challenge orthodoxies, to ask the questions that have to be asked. What did you mean by the reference to red teams and the need to challenge groupthink? Um, uh, I, I um, not only will answer that, but very much want to answer that, but may I just, before I do, say that I, I doubt that the, the right analysis is that there was um, a, a, a set of um, uh, experts who got it all wrong. I think it's more likely that, that what happened was that the fact that it goes back to the impact versus cause issue and the likelihood versus impact issue. I suspect that what happened was that the scientists and the medics all came to the conclusion that the most likely thing was pandemic flu and that other things had a much lower chance of success, uh, of success in, in attacking us and that uh, Therefore, the attention should be focused on pandemic flu. If they had been focused on impact rather than on cause, they might have uh, observed that it was very likely that whatever particular virus it was that attacked us would require to be tested, to be traced, to have PPE associated with it, to have vaccines developed for it and so on, which are dealing with the impact and, as you say, minimizing it uh, in advance, trying to avoid having a catastrophe rather than, or minimize the catastrophe rather than simply handling it. Uh, uh, and it, I think that that was the mistake, that, that that was a strategic error to which you, you refer. Uh, and I think it, if, if we were to reorient our resilience planning towards impacts and to being prepared for them, uh, we could make much better progress. And indeed, in some respects, uh, even at my, the end of my time, for other reasons to do with Ebola, for example, I pressed for the vaccine network, which Mark Wolpert then took forward with Chris Whitty, and it, it did happen, and I think it was a very helpful thing, although it wasn't developed specifically for the, the virus we were attacked by, because I knew nothing of it, but I did see from Ebola that there was a, a, a need to have a much better system for producing vaccines. Um, and uh, I think it's very clear if you look at the results of Exercise Alice, which went on uh, at the very end of my time and was uh, implemented or perhaps not very well implemented after my time, uh, actually it had looked at the question of the scaling of testing, which Matt Hancock refers to in his evidence, uh, or the lack of ability to scale testing. And uh, it also looks at the question of the uh, rollout of, of uh, tracking data. Uh, so these things were known, but they were not being attended to because people were not thinking about impacts in general. They were monomaniacally focused on uh, uh, pandemic flu. This is exactly why I think a red team is needed. And what do you mean by a red team? How, how, how in future can orthodoxy be challenged effectively within the confines of a bureaucracy, in, in, in the confines of a government system? It, it can't be challenged within the confines of the normal bureaucratic system because uh, officials are just like the rest of us. They would like their careers to progress. 
And if you're a member of a team and you start being a frightful nuisance, it is not a career-enhancing move. Uh, so they need to be separate. They need to be accountable to a different person than the person who's responsible for the thing that they're meant to be inquiring about. Um, whether, as I prefer, they be completely outside government or whether they be within government but somehow sufficiently insulated so that they, their careers can progress, notwithstanding causing trouble for colleagues in government, um, is, is, I suppose, a matter for choice. Uh, but the crucial thing is that there be, a, this is not expensive, incidentally, but just a, 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 a smallish number, 20 or 30 people, with the relevant expertise. Because one of my problems in all of this, obviously, was, as you rightly described, that I was an amateur. Um, this should be done by professionals. So you want someone in the red team who, all right, may not be as expert as the government chief scientist, or so, but nevertheless is a, a plausible, credible scientist, a, a credible medic, a, a credible, cred, credible industrialist, and so on. And if, if they're sitting there and they're saying, well, hold on, you haven't asked this question, it becomes very difficult not to start thinking about it. Mm. And at the moment, there is no such mechanism in place. So you mentioned earlier the possibility of a, of a new statutory resilience institute, and, and we'll come on to that in a moment. How would such a body, whilst providing challenge to groupthink and performing the, the, the red team function of which, it, which you've described, how would it, though, be able to exercise the, the political control, or, or how would it exercise the political influence to which you made reference earlier I in terms of being able to, to be near the Prime Minister and to make ah. sure that what is to be done is done, is carried out, is put into effect? Well, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm delighted you mentioned the Prime Minister because I don't think it's a matter of political influence or political power or the power to do things. It's a matter of whether this red team reports quite directly to the Minister of Resilience, if there is one full-time proper, and the Prime Minister. Right. If they do, things will happen. If if they're I'm terribly sorry. If if they're siphoned off into reporting to some elaborate set of um, in, internal committees and bureaucracies, nothing at all will happen. It'll be absorbed and re. Um, uh, it will re-emerge as mush. Uh, it has to go directly to the people who can then say this can't be business as usual. The red team has pointed out we're missing something. What is going to be done about it? You refer to Mush. Um, in November 2015, you wrote an article called Five Principles for Getting Things Done in Whitehall. Principle one, volume is usually in inverse proportion to effectiveness. Uh, and you say this, the longer the document, be it legislation, strategy, or a simple submission, the less effective it is for advising ministers, communicating with the public, or getting whatever result you're looking for. Whilst you were a minister, what, what view did you form about the profusion of paperwork, the, the sheer number of policy documents, guidance documents, strategy material, and so on? Uh, I formed the view that it was highly counterproductive. Uh, uh, I, you will have seen my letter to the Prime Minister establishing the, uh, notifying that I was establishing the horizon scanning um, uh, uh, for viruses after Ebola that he and I had agreed. You will have observed it's a page long. It was an absolute rule for me. I wrote endless memoranda to the Prime Minister in that role, as you might imagine. It was an absolute rule of mine that if I couldn't get it on one page, the maximum it would ever be is two because I knew he was very busy and I wanted him to be able to find out what, in essence, uh, I was trying to say to him. Uh, on the other side, I was unfortunately, as part of my role, uh, responsible for receiving every public-facing document produced by Her Majesty's Government. They all came across my desk. And uh, 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 some of them were um, many times longer than the uh, material warranted, and I started a process of putting in three um, jars, green, yellow, and red um, tags uh, that my private office very kindly arranged for me, 
And so we could keep track of how many of these documents were ludicrously overweight and incomprehensible. And uh, it was about a third, a third, a third. A third were pretty good and quite short and clear. A third were not very good, and a third were totally catastrophic. And on the catastrophic ones, I sent them back. And I asked for them to be produced at much lesser length. In most cases, I got back something less than a quarter of what I'd started with. It then often required further work to get it to be clear what the person was saying, and we could sometimes then get it down to half of that length. There's a huge overproduction of large documents. Mann and Alexander are pretty eloquent about this, and they're right. Yes, although their own report, of course, did weigh in at a monstrous 321 it, pages. It's too long, but otherwise it's right. <laughs> um, Milady has heard evidence that um, if, if you happen to be a local resilience forum and tasked with the primary duty of responding locally to uh, d the duty of preparing for emergencies and then also responding to them. You would have to be familiar with Cabinet Office produced documents such as the concept of operations document at 80 pages, the revision to emergency preparedness document at 591 pages, multiple versions of a document called emergency response and recovery, there are national resilience planning assumptions, engagement with and guidance for emergency responses, JSIP paperwork, local risk management guidance, humanitarian aspect guidance, Department of Health guidance, pandemic influenza strategic framework guidance, and so on and so forth. Do you believe that there is a case for a radical rewrite of the available policy, strategy, planning documentation? Uh, I don't think there's just a case. I think it obviously needs to happen. But if it happens without having uh, a well-organized central um, uh, team under a head of resilience who has direct access to the Prime Minister and is parallel to the um, uh, uh, National Security Advisor, uh, it will be wasted effort because it will just dissipate through endless consultations and committees all around Whitehall, and the simplification exercise will become a complication exercise. So. Uh, What's critical is to have a, a group of people who are determined to produce clarity and then set them to the task of producing clarity out of what is currently much too unclear and much too verbose. Now, sort of, a, may we turn just to some specific um, issues and, and areas on which um, I want to ask you for your views? Before you do, Mr. Keith, I'm sorry to interrupt. Going back to the point about you just made about the head of resilience and a specialist team, given the point you made about somebody having the ear of the Prime Minister, would your head of resilience be an independent person with an independent agency, or would it be somebody ministerial like you who had the ear of the Prime Minister? Well, there are various models around the world, and some of them do have an agency. Um, uh, and, of course, we have agencies for some purposes, um, and that is a possible model. I don't personally favour it because I think there is a risk that in this absolutely crucial function central to the uh, purposes of government as a whole, it's very important that the person heading the work and the people working under them have direct access to the Prime Minister, and that's much more easily done from within the centre of government than anywhere else. I don't think it's just a question of having a minister, however. I think there needs to be, as is foreshadowed in the framework, uh, the resilience framework just published by uh, Oliver Dowden, a head of resilience who is an official who is parallel in stature to the National Security Advisor and has, as the National Security Advisor, has direct access to the Prime Minister. If you had that combination of a full-time senior cabinet minister for resilience exclusively, and a head of resilience, parallel to National Security Advisor, I think you would find that it worked as I worked with Jeremy Haywood when he was Cabinet Secretary on the policy implementation front. He and I would meet for an hour or so each day, and we'd go through the various questions of what had or hadn't been implemented, and I would ring ministers, and he would ring permanent secretaries, and often enough, by the end of the day, we had actually managed to get something done. And that's what you need as a sort of pincer movement. 
and you need those people then to be able to walk into the Prime Minister's office without too much ado and without having to schedule it weeks off and say, we've hit a problem here, uh, we need your help in commanding that something be done. That, I think, would be the most effective model, but I understand that there are people who think that, and there are reasons why they might think that an independent agency would be better, less captured by the system and so on. I don't discount that possibility, I just think it's less perfect. In your statement, you refer to, uh, you say this, the working relationships um, are as least as important as any structure, systems, processes, plans, and policies. The system doesn't appear to have changed dramatically between 2011 and, and 2020. C can you recall, therefore, what the position was in relation to the nature of working relationships with, firstly, regional bodies, and secondly, the devolved administrations, from the viewpoint of a United Kingdom minister in the field of civil contingencies? Well, um, by the time I uh, was dealing with uh, resilience issues, uh, the uh, government offices of the regions had been abolished. Indeed, in 2011. Yes, I think fairly early in 2011 it must have happened. Um, uh, therefore, I can't comment on uh, relations with them. Uh, or how effective they were. I'm very sympathetic to the view that's taken in some of the papers I've now read as a result of the inquiry, uh, including Man Alexander, that uh, um, uh, it would be helpful to have a, a regional tier uh, coordinating uh, local resilience forums. Um, uh, I hadn't thought of it before reading these papers, but I, I see now that, that that might well be a useful thing. Um, uh, I can, of course, comment on relations with the devolved administrations, um, not actually in relation to the resilience planning that I was involved in, because when it came to the critical national infrastructure and trying to make it more prepared for various kinds of impact, that was an England exercise, because it, the, uh, the critical national infrastructure is a devolved matter, and I, I would not have succeeded um, in doing the kind of inquisitorial work that I was doing with the English providers of the structures, the, the infrastructure, uh, in, in the devolved administrations. However, when it came to handling specific crises, so for example, flooding, uh, um, Ebola, um, uh, the uh, fuel tanker crises, um, uh, we did have repeated um, involvement of the devolved administrations, senior representatives of the devolved administrations, appearing in COBRA, usually by video. And I had offline uh, pretty continuous conversations with, for example, John Swinney, who was then, I think, the deputy first minister in Scotland. And I have to say that, that although, as you might imagine, there was some friction with the Scottish administration when it came to constitutional issues about independence and uh, union, there was no friction when it came to dealing with these, that I could observe, when it came to dealing with these issues. Uh, uh, I, I, uh, and indeed, indeed with, with uh, I, was, I was at Brighton when the Brighton bomb occurred. I'm not a, a lifelong devotee of the IRA, but I had a perfectly sensible conversation with McGuinness about doing things in Northern Ireland in the context of these crises. My experience was, you could do business with the devolved administrations perfectly well on the basis of establishing some degree of personal trust and limiting the scope of the discussion specifically to something where we both had an equal interest and they, as much as I, wanted to protect their populations. Resilience is, as you've already observed, a devolved issue. But pandemics don't recognise borders. And therefore, would you agree that any proper system of emergency preparedness and response must have in place structures for dealing with other territories, other nations in the United Kingdom, where there will have to be a joined up response? Yes, I think that's particularly true with uh, biological agents. Indeed. Although, uh, for example, in relation to the electricity grid, 
there is, of course, a, a deep interconnection with Scotland, and indeed, while we're at it, with France. And uh, therefore, I had discussions with the devolved administration in Scotland and with French counterparts when I was concerned with the protection of the grid. So, it, 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 yes, you have to involve all those who are involved. And if you're looking at impacts, you'll quickly discover who is involved. Uh, and the impact of a virus is very likely to be uh, nationwide, or indeed, as we saw in this case, global. But your answer, Sir Oliver, appear to indicate that the connections that you forged with the devolved administrations were based more on ministerial inclination and your own personal involvement than on a formalized system of uh, committees or, 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 or some body which would allow the devolved administrations and the UK government in Westminster to be able to, to liaise and plan properly and fully. Was there not in place that formal structure? Did the system, in fact, depend too much on ministerial inclination? I don't know what I think about that. I, the, half of me wants to say, you're right. Uh, well, sorry, you are factually right. There was not such a formal system. Uh, and half of me wants to say that, you know, that sounds like a gap. The other half of me says, actually, you can create any set of formal institutions you want, but if, if everyone arrives ready to come to blows, you won't get anywhere. Mm. If you don't have any formal system, but you have good personal relationships, you can probably get it done pretty well informally. So, Well, isn't the answer that you need both a, you don't need an overly ossified system, but, but you need a system by which everybody can expect to play their part and, and can envisage an attendance and, and they can attend and do what needs to be done alongside good personal working relations. That would be the ideal. Yes. I agree. All right. Just before Mr. Keith goes on, um, Solover, you mentioned um, working relationships with Northern Ireland and with Scotland. Did the same apply to Wales? I didn't, as it happens, have... Um, uh, Oh, sorry. I, I, there's one occasion when I did have a relationship with, with the Welsh administration, which is in relation to flooding, which happened to involve them as, as well uh, 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 as, as uh, England. Um, uh, and I think the same applied. They were, they were, they were present at, at, at relevant COBRA meetings by video. We had a perfectly working relationship. As it happens, in the other cases I was dealing with, Wales was not a particularly material issue. Also in your statement, you address the issue of the need for exercises, and you state that you believe that the United King Kingdom government should regularise the practice of simulating responses to a variety of whole system emergencies by carrying out at least two such large-scale simulations in each parliament. Um, Putting aside the resource implications and, and putting aside the undoubted fact that such exercises are difficult and complex things to arrange, why would exercises with such regularity have a demonstrably beneficial impact? I mean, if, if there is an exercise, for example, every five years, um, and recommendations and actions which flow from the exercise are properly implemented and acted upon, would that not be sufficient for the foreseeable future, or at least for the next five years, before having another exercise? In a particular domain, I think my answer to your question is yes. That, that, that's to say, if every five years we exercised for the impact uh, of an unknown um, but ghastly virus or bacterial agent and we we did it properly and we learned the lessons in the sense not of writing great volumes about it but actually getting down to the business of correcting the things that had emerged as not in place um, that would be pretty good that would be much better than than we're likely to do at the moment uh, but if you had for each domain one exercise every five years, you'd be having um, uh, an exercise every, well, it depends how many domains you create, but at least every year, more, more frequently than I'm recommending, in other words. My two years suggested 
that for a particular domain you probably wouldn't have a repeat for 10 years because you'd want to deal with uh, the impacts of virus, you'd want to deal with major impacts on uh, two or three different elements of our critical national infrastructure, you'd want to deal with major events of flooding. You know, there are various impacts that you want to look at and exercise for, and so a regular program uh, would involve quite a long period between the time when you did one and hopefully implemented the recommendations of it and then go on with the next one on that same subject. It's just in your statement, you, you suggest wholesale, a uh, whole system emergency exercises, at least two in each parliament, which yes. would tend to suggest a greater frequency than once every five years. And of course, if it were focused only on one contingency, you would end up with an exercise in each contingency every two years. Yeah, but I wasn't suggesting on one contingency. So, ah, so across it, the board. Across the board. So the, there are lots and lots of minor emergencies. I don't think you need to have whole system exercises about them. There are identifiably, you could argue five, you could argue ten, but it's sort of not less than five and not more than ten, major kinds of whole system emergency that might affect the UK, leaving aside their causes. And if you exercise for each of those every five years, you would end up with more than two a parliament. Um, if you exercised each of those every 10 years, you would end up with roughly two a parliament. That was what I was thinking. Right. You referred earlier to Exercise Alice, and, and you suppose that perhaps the recommendations from Exercise Alice had not been, or maybe they had been properly implemented. It was, in fact, after your time, and, and particularly in relation to opera, uh, Exercise Signet and Exercise Signus. The recommendations and the actions which flow from an exercise appear to a very large extent to be left to the government of the day to give effect to, to, to the ministers, to the civil servants. And, and of course, they're not all automatically put into place. Is there an argument that there needs to be a fresh, a, a new process by which we may be assured that all lessons and recommendations which by by necessary implication are sensible ones from an exercise which challenges the country's emergency response systems are put into place and are seen to be put into place? Uh, abundantly, yes. Uh, I, I, some of this is ground we've covered in the sense that one of the things you need is for, in my view, an external red team in a resilience institute that would be keeping track of whether these things had been done. Uh, and, and simply couldn't be stopped from doing so. The, the second thing we haven't covered, but is covered in the government's resilience framework and is also in the Man Alexander report and various other uh, documents, uh, which is that there ought to be regular reporting to parliament uh, that can't be evaded. Uh, not because the, the parliamentary debate in itself will shed much light, but because the, the duty to report to parliament will cause the whole system to worry about whether it has actually implemented these things. Uh, but the third element we have dealt on, uh, 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 dealt with, which is that there needs to be a, sufficient, a sufficiently well-armed body inside government or as a separate agency, one or the other, which pursues these questions remorselessly and at a high level and brings to the attention of the Prime Minister and if there is one, the Minister of Resilience, if there are things which were uh, the product of a particular report of a particular exercise which have not been implemented. If you had that triple, terribly sorry, if you had that triple architecture, I think you would stand a very good chance that most of the stuff would be implemented pretty well. Are you moving to a different topic or the same one? I was going to conclude with one final topic, a very short one, my lady. Matter for you, whichever you prefer. Shall I um, continue and then conclude it? Um, it's obvious that resourcing is a most difficult subject and, and one that is, of course, highly politicised. And, and it forms no function of this inquiry, of course, to, to advise or direct that anything be done in terms of resources. Resources are a matter of fact and funding levels are a, a matter of different factors. 
there would appear to be a problem, therefore, in so far as um, decisions about future funding and future resources have to be left to the politicians to decide. But would the creation of this new architecture to which you refer, and a new resilience institute, be able to at least address in part that problem? Because it could make recommendations as to how money should be spent. And therefore, that would give the politicians the ability to be able to, to more transparently and more openly make the decisions about future resources. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I see that as one of the major roles of the Resilience Institute. Um, uh, it's extremely important to um, realize that most of the steps that really most need to be taken to improve resilience in most fields do not cost very much. Um, uh, the, the problem has not been that there wasn't money available to stockpile PPE or that uh, uh, we couldn't have afforded to have a scale-up process for uh, testing. Uh, uh, these are minuscule amounts in the context of uh, 150 billion pounds a year of health spending. Uh, one can argue till the cows come home about whether it was or wasn't a good thing to uh, constrain government expenditure and put the finances back in order. I would argue it was. Others would argue it wasn't. But Should we leave, not go there? Exactly. Right. Leave that wholly aside. Under any dispensation that's remotely plausible to the United Kingdom, we could afford to do perfectly easily all of the things that would most protect us uh, against uh, the biggest impacts of these uh, major whole system emergencies uh, for, for, for tiny amounts of money. The problem is identifying what they are and forcing the money to be spent when the PAC and public opinion and the media and so on are all too likely to say, the money's been wasted. You've been holding this stockpile for the last 15 years. We haven't had an emergency. What are you doing? And th then it doesn't matter whether it costs 50 pounds or 50 billion pounds, because they all sound the same. And it's a waste. It's a scandal. We have to change the culture so that it's accepted that consciously spending money that we hope will never be used uh, is a good thing to do if, in an emergency, it would save us a huge amount of uh, effect on human beings and our economy. And that change of culture is what I hope the Resilience Institute could begin to achieve, the reports to Parliament could begin to achieve, the fact of having uh, 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 the, uh, the resilience uh, uh, head sitting right next to the Prime Minister would begin to achieve. It, once you accept that this is a fundamental feature of government and well worth spending a little bit of money on, then you've changed the culture and much will follow. Does that analysis apply equally to the field of public health improvement, which I think it's generally accepted as a far more expensive um, matter than the, the narrow air of emergency preparedness? Because in the context of a pandemic, a health crisis, a, a more resilient public health structure is obviously desirable, but is itself perhaps very much more expensive. I don't think that most of the things that are most important in that domain are very expensive either by comparison with the vast sums under any dispensation we're going to be spending on health. Um, it's typically much, much cheaper to prevent things, whether in the health domain or any other, than it is to deal with the after effects. We, we've just spent, I don't know what it is, 300, the inquiry will probably find out, 350, 450 billion pounds on the effects of COVID. We're talking about minuscule amounts by comparison with that. And it's well worth investing in advance. Oliver, thank you. Two short questions from me, Mr. Oliver. Um, you, you, was, you seem to be um, disparaging about the um, lead government department model. It's inevitable that the expertise on um, transport will lie in the Department of Transport and Health and the Department of Health and so on. I don't, I, in that sense, I don't decry the idea that when we have relatively minor uh, 
problems. So I found myself, for example, at one stage involved in uh, what was not trivial for the people involved, but was not a large-scale disaster of, of individuals who were trapped the other side of the channel or uh, you know, further afield because an airline was collapsing and they couldn't get home, which is a, a minor emergency. Uh, uh, the Department of Transport was perfectly well equipped to deal with it. They knew what they were doing. I sat with them, uh, but it was not necessary to convoke some great in, you know, cross-governmental arrangement. Um, so the idea that, that those kinds of risks should be handled by individual departments, I think, is perfectly sensible. There are, as I say, not causes but impacts that are so big that they are definitely rightly described as whole of system. You know them when you see them, um, and we could list them. And for those, I think the idea that one department is in charge is mad because they're not going to be in charge when you get to the response. The, the, the system we were operating already meant that they were not in charge and it would not have been in charge in the response because in response we would have gathered in COBRA, we would have been chaired by the Prime Minister, we would have, uh, and I, I think the incident of the XO and XS uh, committees that Michael Gove uh, established uh, uh, originally to deal with Brexit, to my mind the only advantage of Brexit for COVID, uh, 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 were useful, but would be useful uh, in handling uh, any future cross-government uh, whole of system emergency. So it's very clear to me that you can't describe these major risks, uh, whole system risks, uh, as owned by a department, and, and, and therefore they need to be attended to by a central entity that keeps its focus on that and, and learns continuously and has any corporate existence. Thank you. Um, the, the other question I had was that you mentioned support for the um, idea from Man Alexander about regional tiers of resilience for... Um, I'm no lover of bureaucracy, as you uh, gather from some things I've said, um, Sir Oliver, but if you have a regional layer, why aren't you just imposing yet another structure? Somebody's got to manage the structure, call the meetings, handle the minutes. Why, why doesn't it become an unnecessary layer of bureaucracy on top of what is already quite a complex system? Well, it could do. Um, but um, perhaps it would help if I illustrated this not from my um, cabinet office um, uh, experience, but from my experience as a local MP in West Dorset, um, uh, the, 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 the LRF, the Local Resilience Forum in Dorset, is composed of uh, people from Dorset, uh, county council, um, police, um, so on. Um, and, you know, if there's a, a problem at the village of Piddle Hinton, this is fine. But if there's a widespread problem around, um, shall we say, the flooding of the southwest, as, as unfortunately happens reasonably frequently, um, uh, first of all, the ambulance service is not organized on a county basis. It's organized on a regional basis. Uh, secondly, rivers inconveniently don't follow county boundaries. So uh, if you want to manage them, you've got to manage uh, upstream and downstream, and you have several counties involved. I, I, I'd be tedious to go on enumerating. There are I get the point. various respects in which, for mid-level crises, regional coordination is necessary. It's then just a question of whether you set it up ad hoc, which is what happens at the moment, or whether you have it there permanently. My argument for having it there in a small... I mean, I'm talking about five people or something, but a small group of people uh, being there permanently is that then, as well as bringing together the relevant people to handle the emergency when it arises, they could be involved in the planning in advance, and so when they got to the emergency, they'd know about it, the coordination. Thank you very much. Well, um, I think that's all the questions. Isn't there are it? no real 10 full questions, my lady. You've been extremely helpful and been very Thank interesting, you. Oliver. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You. I shall return at 22.12.
My lady, may I call George Osborne, please? Would you like to take the oath? Please repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God, I swear by Almighty God, I swear by Almighty God that the evidence I shall give that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Thank you. Is your full name George Gideon Oliver Osborne? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, thank you for the assistance that you've given to the inquiry thus far, Mr Osborne, uh, provision of your witness statement and also documents. Uh, and thank you for coming to give evidence to the inquiry today. Uh, please keep your voice up and speak into the microphones so that the stenographer can hear you for the transcript. Um, you were Shadow Chancellor from 2005 to 2010, then Chancellor of the Exchequer from 2010 to 2016, and First Secretary of State from May 2015 to July 2016. Your witness statement is at INQ 00018730. Uh, it's on screen now. Please can you confirm that that is your witness statement and that it's true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, my lady, may we have permission to publish it? Thank you. Yeah. We can take that down. Before we start, Mr Osborne, I understand that you want to say a few words. Well, I just wanted to express my heartfelt sympathy to all those who lost a loved one during the pandemic. Uh, and for those who feel things could have been done differently, I hope the inquiry gets to the bottom of what those things might have been. Thank you. I'm going to ask you questions about whether or not the Treasury had a plan for a pandemic, and if so, what that was, and how the Treasury contributed to the government's planning for a pandemic. I emphasise from the outset that this examination is not a discussion or a debate about the merits or otherwise of the government's fiscal policy uh, or, or indeed the imposition of austerity. We will touch upon the effects of a sustained period of austerity in the United Kingdom, but only in so far as it relates uh, to the state of the country's preparedness and resilience when COVID hit. In order to put your evidence in context, Mr Osborne, the Treasury is the government's economic and finance ministry. It maintains control over public spending and sets the direction of the United Kingdom's economic policy. And as Chancellor, uh, you were the minister of the uh, government in charge of the Treasury. There are other important entities in the financial architecture that we will touch upon, including the Office for budget responsibility, which you set up during your tenure as Chancellor. Um, in your witness statement uh, at paragraph 7 to 11, we don't need to look at it, I'm going to attempt to summarise it. Um, when you came to power immediately after the 2008 financial crisis, uh, you imposed an economic policy um, intended to improve the United Kingdom public finances and meaning that the United Kingdom was in better financial shape to face the pandemic when it hit. Uh, you say in your statement that your handling of the Treasury allowed the government to fund the furlough scheme and the bounce back loan scheme and other pandemic fallout, that you made reforms to financial services, which meant that there wasn't a banking crisis as a result of the COVID um, pandemic and that you invested in research and development, importantly, vaccine development, uh, which was important um, when COVID hit. Is that a fair summary of your explanation as you give it in your witness statement of the policy that you implemented? Uh, yes, it is. Thank you. So that gives us an understanding of how you believe the Treasury, under your watch, contributed to the government's preparedness for a pandemic. But I want to explore with you the plan that the Treasury had uh, for a, a pandemic. You say at paragraph 16 in your witness statement that for the risks where the Treasury is allocated as a lead department, it develops scenarios and determines the potential impacts and likelihood of the risk in question. Uh, that was the case uh, prior to at the COVID-19 pandemic. So does it follow, Mr Osborne, that where the Treasury, w Treasury was not the lead government department, it didn't develop such scenarios? 
basically, yes. Uh, so th if I might elaborate, I mean, there are certain crises which the Treasury is clearly directly responsible. Such uh, a bank, as a banking crisis. A banking crisis, yes. uh, uh, an economic crisis, a run on the pound. Sadly, our country has experienced many of these over the decades. Um, and the Treasury is clearly the lead department, to pick up on the conversation that you've just been having with Oliver Letwin, yes. for those crises. Um, but when it comes to other kinds of crises that, are that might affect a government, uh, the Treasury is, is a contributor to the whole of government plan that usually another department leads in the case of pandemics, the Department of Health. The Department of Health, yes. So we'll look in a moment at how the Treasury assisted the Department of Health being the lead government department for pandemic preparedness. But before we do, could we please display on the screen page 8, paragraph 20 of your witness statement uh, and read through it together, please. You say here, between 2010 and 2016, Her Majesty's Treasury and therefore the Chancellor contributed to cross-government preparations for civil emergencies. This contribution broadly fell into four categories. A, the monitoring, assessing and managing of economic and fiscal risks. B, leading responsibility in government for monitoring and responding to risks to the stable operation of the UK financial system, learning the lessons of the financial crisis. <laughs> C, setting budgets and applying spending controls and or conditions for government departments, although noting that it was ultimately for the relevant Secretary of State to decide how to allocate their budgets. And D, preparing Her Majesty's Treasury's own corporate structures to enable effective crisis management, working closely with the permanent secretary and other senior officials, again learning from the financial crisis. So, so summarising those four points, you believed that the Treasury's job was to plan for economic and fiscal risks, a stable operation of the United Kingdom financial system, at setting the budgets and applying spending controls and also preparing the Treasury's own corporate structures to enable effective crisis management. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Whilst this may well be a form of pandemic planning, these are all purely economic risks and matters which fall directly under the Treasury's remit in any event. These are the Treasury acting on business as usual, aren't they? Well, the only thing I would draw attention to is that most um, whole country crises, of which a pandemic is an obvious example, but uh, you know, a devastating military attack, uh, you know, a catastrophic um, civil emergency of some kind, would probably lead to a second crisis, which is an economic or financial one. And indeed, in the spring of uh, 2020, you know, I wasn't in government, but it was clear for everyone observing government that they were not only dealing with a health emergency, but they were dealing with an economic emergency and a financial emergency. And a huge amount of effort, successful as it turns out, was put into trying to stabilise the markets, make sure the banking system didn't fall over. Um, and so I think, you know, it's quite hard to think of, you know, crises on the scale of COVID that would not also have the potential to tip into a fiscal crisis and or a financial crisis, fiscal being about the ability of the government to fund itself, financial being about the ability of the banking system to cope with the crisis. So I think, un, un, you know, unlike other things which you might look at, it, the, you know, most major civil crises have the potential to tip into an economic and financial crisis. All right. But, but given how central the Treasury is to the functioning of the United Kingdom and its economy, do you agree that there appears to have been no planning for external shocks which would have a major economic impact? In other words, no specific pandemic planning, no plan in the Treasury? Well, you know, I've, I've been following the um, uh, evidence given to this inquiry yes. um, with interest and before appearing here, and you have covered this territory, I'm happy to cover it myself. But clearly, you know, the UK, as indeed I think is the case of most Western democracies at the time, has an influenza plan. And the Treasury had done some work on what the impact of that would be. Uh, and it's a hit to GDP. There's an expected uh, period when much of the workforce might be absent from work for a week or two. 
uh, and there's, uh, you know, tragically in that case, there would be a high mortality rate. The Treasury basically had the structures to deal with that because there are already sickness benefits. There are already structures available for companies to pay people who are not working, who have the flu. Uh, and in the exercises that had been done before I came to office, there were some very specific supply chain issues that had been established if there, if there was an influenza uh, pandemic around things like the impact on the travel industry and the, the like, given what subsequently happened very small scale. Yes. You're absolutely right that there was no planning done in, by the UK Treasury or indeed as far as I'm aware any Western Treasury uh, for asking the entire population to stay at home for months and months yes. on end, uh, essentially depriving large sectors of the economy like hospitality of all their customers for months and months to come. That, and, that could have been done, couldn't it? Well, you're, you're completely right that if someone had said, and I know that's absolutely cool to what this module of inquiry is looking at. If someone had said, you, the UK government, should be preparing for a lockdown that might last for months, then I've absolutely no doubt the Treasury would have developed the schemes that it did subsequently develop around the furlough, uh, the COVID loans and the like. What I would say, you know, in defence of the officials I work with, who were some of the most hardworking and dedicated public servants I've ever come across, is that in 2020, it turned out to be fairly easy and rapid to be able to put those support systems in place. Not all the other areas we're going to, I'm sure, cover around, uh, around the health service, but the actual economic support schemes, like furlough, were designed by hardworking Treasury officials in, under a pressure situation very quickly and put in place. So yes, planning could have been done for a furlough scheme in advance, I'm not clear, observing it as a, the, at that point just a citizen, I'm not clear that that would have made a better furlough scheme than the one we actually, uh, as a country, saw. All right. Well, well, taking other examples than lockdown and furlough, um, using, for instance, a, a plan um, to consider the economic um, output um, required for self-isolation or the COVID business interruption loans or, or mm. any um, economic mm. effect of a mitigation action. Um, none, none of that was done. That there, there could have been planning, joined up planning between the Department of Health identifying what the mitigation actions were being considered uh, and the Treasury then coming in and dealing with a worst case scenario, a middle case scenario, mm. and assessing whether or not the proposed mitigation actions were economically worthwhile. N none of that sort of planning took place, did it? Well, you're, you're, you're right that there was no planning in Britain, or indeed, as far as I'm aware, in France, Germany, United States, or anywhere else. Well, we're dealing for, just with... Well, yeah, but it's know. important because I think if you're challenging, uh, you know, the phrase that's come up here, groupthink, you know, it was not a groupthink unique to this country. It, there was no assumption that you would ask the population to stay at home, or stop, ask, sorry, for, uh, mandate that the population stay at home for months and months on end and what that... And so there was no uh, planning uh, for the for a lockdown. Um, Whose fault was it that there was no prior thinking that that could... Well, I don't, I, I don't think it's particularly fair to sort of apportion blame because, you know, the entire scientific medical community, um, again, you know, hard-working individuals with, with the best of intentions, you know, we're not, we're, we're not elevating this particular possibility of a coronavirus that would have this level of contagion, this, have asymptomatic patients, uh, and the, you know the Treasury or indeed the Education Department or the criminal justice system should pay attention and come up with some plans for if that was to happen. But if we had, I mean, I think you know, sorry, to, you know, if you look at the plan then the planning for the influenza pandemic, and of course we don't know in practice we have to come into contact with reality how it would have fared. But it's clear that the Treasury and indeed the rest of the government responds to reasonable requests by saying, yes, you know, please stock um, antivirals. Yes, like, please 
uh, have in place advanced vaccine, uh, uh, having advanced vaccine purchasing agreements? Yes. Let's have some money set aside for call centres we can set up. But yes. that is different so, to, that is very different to sitting down with the Department of Health and working out whether or not there would be such a catastrophic effect to a lockdown that it would have to be um, considered. And the benefit of, of considering that prior to the right. incident hitting is you're not making these decisions well, on the hoof. The, what, I would, what I would observe now, just as a you know, citizen who very much wants this inquiry to come up with uh, some good answers, is I don't think we still know the answer to some of those questions. You know, I don't want to jump ahead for this inquiry, but you know, should the schools have been locked down in the way they were? I, even now, after the inquiry, after the pandemic, we don't know the answer to those questions. Well, certainly I don't, and maybe the inquiry can get to the bottom of that. Well, they're certainly worth asking. But, you know, they are absolutely, absolutely critical questions about balancing, you know, the life expectancy of an 80-year-old versus the educational opportunities of an 8-year-old. Incredibly hard questions, and it's not absolutely clear to me now that as a country we know all the rest of the world knows what the answer to those things is so i think it's it's you know a, it, the idea that all of this could have been sort of forethought uh, i don't think it's the case what i think is certainly the case is that if the you know if the expert community and governments had anticipated that there could be an, a pandemic that was not an influenza but was a another form of respiratory disease and had characteristics that weren't like influenzas, like uh, asymptomatic patients and so on, then clearly we could have done certain things, which hopefully this, I'm sure this inquiry will get to around to recommending, to prepare for those things in advance, like stockpiling more PPE. But I've absolutely no doubt that as Chancellor, and indeed any of the Chancellors before me or subsequent to me, if they've been asked to provide a budget for stockpiling PPE, 10, 20, 30 million pounds, whatever it would have been. As, as Oliver Letwin was pointing out, these are very small sums in the overall scheme of the government budget. And I'm pretty certain, like we said yes to everything we were asked to fund with an influenza pandemic, we would have said yes to those things too. Should those questions have been asked? Well, I, you know, I'm with hindsight, yes, but I, I mean, the one, I, I would say the one thing a Treasury can do and I think it's a very powerful statement from the chair of the OBR in, your, in the witness uh, evidence that I was shown, is, you know, he says, Richard Hughes, in the absence of perfect foresight, fiscal space may be the most valuable risk tool. Above all as a country, whatever hits you, you need to be able to respond, to throw, in this case, large amounts of public uh, funds at the problem without it leading to the thing I mentioned earlier, the fiscal crisis or the banking crisis that makes either the situation very much worse or indeed just removes the option of funding. Uh, I mean, poorer countries in the world were not able to afford lockdowns. Poorer countries in the world were not able to provide loans for businesses to stay in operation. Right. Uh, so, you know, this is not some academic question. Uh, and indeed, in our own country in the last 12 months, we saw in the autumn of last year with the, uh, the funding crisis for government debt, that this is not some abstract problem for the UK either. You know, no, if, you no, can't, no. if you can't fund yourself, you cannot spend £340 billion on COVID support. Well, you're going back with respect to the, to the issue of funding. The questions were based around the lack of sure. preparation, the lack of planning. You've, you've well, raised... The, the, just so, sorry, I would say that part of preparation and planning yes. is as an economy to have flexibility to deal with whatever the world's going to throw. But that's only part of it, isn't it? Course, and, yeah. and even recognising the questions that need to be asked, it is not a plan. Once those questions have been identified, there then has to be planning for the practicalities of what might take place. I just want to go to uh, this statement of Richard mm. Hughes, please, as you, as you mention him. He's the chair of the Office of Budget Responsibility, mm. as you say. His statement is at page INQ 0001302270. And if we could go to page five, please, and look at paragraph... 6D of the witness statement. 
And, and whilst, whilst we're waiting for that to be put up on the screen, you will be aware of the evidence that um, Mr Cameron gave to the inquiry yesterday, mm. that in his view, and indeed since he was instrumental in um, bringing into being the National Security Committee and mm. with the um, security advisor um, supporting it, um, he believed that only a whole cross-government response to um, a, a pandemic and to these huge catastrophic risks was, was uh, suitable and was mm. going to work. Um, do you agree, Mr Osborne, that uh, unless the Treasury is, is involved in proper joined-up thinking with mm. the other lead government departments, then there is a piece of the jigsaw missing and it is not a cross-government response? Mm. Uh, yes, I do agree with that. And, I mean, institutionally, the Treasury is involved in every government decision because uh, decisions can't come to the Cabinet, for example, until the Treasury has given its sign-off. So the Treasury, uniquely among the government departments, uh, is already in the weeds of many, many decisions across government. But obviously, the nature of that involvement and the nature of the cooperation is incredibly important. And, you know, I listened with great interest to what my former colleague Oliver Letwin was saying. i would make one observation to the inquiry. Unfortunately, not all ministers are like Oliver Letwin with the kind of self-starting capacity to check everything and chase everything. And you can't build an entire system, unfortunately, around a future uh, supply of Oliver Letwins. No. That's a shame. <laughs> it is. Um, <laughs> Looking at the do document that we've got on screen then, this is, just to remind ourselves, from Richard Hughes, the Chair of the Office for Budget Responsibility. And he says this, while it may be difficult to predict when catastrophic risks will materialise, it is possible to anticipate their broad effects if they do. The risk of a global pandemic was at the top of government risk registers for a decade before coronavirus arrived, but attracted relatively little, and in hindsight, far too little attention from the economic community. I'm going to pause mm. there. Do you agree with that statement? Uh, y yes, I do. With, uh, um, can take that down. But he, as, as he points out, with hindsight, yes. um, it's not just the economic community, obviously, that doesn't give sufficient attention to the you know, possibility of a coronavirus pandemic. It's, it's all sorts of other communities, including the, the health community. Yes. Um, so um, I, I think there is a, you know, I, I, your line of questioning is completely correct to, because it, in my view, you're trying to get to the point which is, I'm sorry, I shouldn't be anticipating what you say, but you're, you're saying, why didn't we plan for a lockdown? Why uh -huh. didn't, right. And the truth is we didn't plan for a lockdown. No treasury did before me, after me, no treasures I'm aware in the rest of the Western world. Um, the influenza pandemic was not going, did not pose the same economic planning challenges that coronavirus subsequently did. Because in an influenza pandemic, um, lots of people get sick. There's, you know, tragically a mortality rate and you have to deal with that. But people are off work for one week uh, and then they come back to work. They're not off work for months and months and months, or not, not off work, but absent from the workplace for months and months and months. You're not, there are not whole sectors of the economy, like airlines that don't have anyone flying on them, or restaurants or pubs that don't have anyone visiting them. Yeah. So, and there's clearly a difference, you, isn't there? So there's a massive right. difference. Except so I think, I think, you know, on the influenza pandemic planning, the Treasury, I mean, it was actually, the work was done before I arrived in office by the previous government, but they'd made an estimate that it would hit the economy around 3% around of GDP. They'd made an estimate about how many people would be sick over a six-month period. They had done some planning to make sure, and indeed, during my period in office, there was planning to make sure that the banking system and the financial system could cope with the expected absenteeism of people having flu at home. Yes. It's completely different to what actually happened in 2020, 2021, where for months and months on end, no one was at work. No, but if the analysis... That no one was just... at work at the workplace. I should, no, okay. Obviously, people were working remotely. If, if the analysis that you've just performed in the witness box had been undertaken prior to COVID hitting, then the Treasury uh, mm. would not have been flying blind in having to make the decisions and give the advice that they did. Why, well, why did that not happen? Well, because no one in no one said to us. I've said this actually in my um, witness statement. With you know, no one said to us there could be a 
a, pand a health pandemic that is not influenza, which could, which, for which the likely response is you're going to have to shut down the economy for months and months on end. So that was not elevated to us as a health risk, and obviously the Treasury not trying to second guess all the you know, health experts. And this is not, I'm not disparaging the health experts who I work with very closely in government. It's just, it, it doesn't seem to me, and in all the documentation I've read, everything I've seen in the rest of uh, much of the world, that anywhere else in the world people are saying, you've got to prepare for this thing. And obviously the entire world is, is caught out by what has happened. And indeed, I don't actually, it's an interesting question, which is only entirely sort of unknowable. Would we all have gone into lockdown if China had not locked down in January or February? I think the Chinese lockdown is what gives the rest of the world the idea of a lockdown. Uh, and it's the overwhelming of the hospital system in northern Italy that then leads all Western governments to reach basically the same conclusion, which is we've got to do the, what the Chinese have done in order to try and preserve our capacity in our emergency wards. Um, and I wonder, I, but it's unknowable, that if we'd done a kind of tabletop exercise in 2011, 2012, yes. that we would have come to the conclusion you could lock down the entire population, uh, that whether that would have even been a feasible policy option, as well, it turned out to be. We'll never know because it was never right. done, was it? Um, we asked the Treasury to provide us with um, any plans, pandemic plans, and evidence of, of what, in fact, was done. Uh, in the time that you were Chancellor. And Catherine Little, who is the Treasurer's second permanent secretary, has provided a witness statement, which I know you will have read, Mr yeah. Osborne. And in it, she says that because the Treasury doesn't hold direct responsibility for pandemic preparedness, that is, um, at the door of the Department of Health, we should ask them for any pandemic preparations um, and to see whether they have any records of any pandemic preparations, uh, including at the Treasury. So we have been provided with plans such as they existed, um, and they are appended to Catherine Little's statement, um, the, the ones that uh, remain with the Treasury. And the only material which the inquiry has been furnished with post-2010 is a project to fund a call centre and purchase antibiotics, both in 2012, and uh, requests dealing with the funding of the pandemic flu clinical countermeasure Tamiflu. Uh, other than those held within the Treasury, there are no plans, uh, no reaction to any of the Department of Health mitigation proposals, uh, and, and nothing specifically relating to any pandemic threat. Do you accept that? Well, I, what I would accept is that um, there, there are, I would say, there, the, the items you cite are examples of, of, of to my knowledge, uh, 100% of the requests made to the Treasury to fund things that would help deal with a influenza pandemic are funded. Uh, and you gave the examples there. There is also a whole set of planning that goes on during this period to deal with banking crises and endless uh, you know, exercises which I took part in and structures with, with us and the Bank of England and the Prudential Regulatory. But, but we're talking about pandemic planning. No, but that was... So pandemic, I think, you know, that would have been part of the thinking, which is if there's a crisis, you know, can the banking system cope? Um, but there's not, you know, we've, uh, well, I don't want to repeat myself, there's certainly, there is not planning for a coronavirus pandemic. Should there have been a plan, a blueprint, some sort of playbook from the Treasury containing strategies and plans that could have been turned to and considered? when something like the pandemic occurred? Well, with hindsight, yes. But as I've said, I question whether in 2011, 2012, 2013, if someone had come to us and said, right, there's going to be a coronavirus pandemic and we're going to ask the whole population to stay indoors for three months, I wonder in 2011, 12, 13, whether anyone would have thought that was a, a plausible plan. I mean, it turned out to be one, but yeah, after partly parts of other parts of the world had started doing it. If there had been a series of papers, um, a series of levels of mm. consideration given to different mm. scenarios um, dealing with 
different assumptions. So whether what was coming down the line might be symptomatic or asymptomatic, how, how quickly it was likely to reproduce uh, as a disease. Then in advance mm. of COVID hitting, uh, you would know as Chancellor which economic levers would need to be pulled uh, and how best the Treasury could support the mitigation actions of the Department of Health. And the, the, mm. the problem with not having that thinking mm. taken place uh, uh, some time before the pandemic hits is that, as I've said before, the, the result of that is the Treasury's acting on the hoof. Well, I, I don't think that's entirely fair. So first of all, you know, the Treasury is by its nature it, it, it's not a big delivery department. It has around a thousand individuals who are you know, exceptionally capable uh, civil servants who can deploy their talents and abilities to different policy problems as the world throws them. Uh, you know, in the last two years, they've suddenly had to deal with the Ukraine and energy supplies in the way that you know, the Treasury would not have had a big standing capability to do with before. But that's one of the great strengths of the British um, Treasury. Um, there are definitely, you know, following your line of questioning, things that we could have uh, done uh, if this kind of th threat of a coronavirus pandemic had been identified in advance. So we could have, I'm making sort of, uh, you know, sort of, I think, straightforward observations, like we could have stockpiled more PPE because we wouldn't have, we would have might have anticipated that the whole world would want to get hold of this material and it was only being produced in a certain number of factories on the other side of the world. And the US government was you know, doing everything to get hold of it. And so we could have stopped part more of that. Um, you know, for example, we could have maybe looked at things like having more respirators in hospitals than we would normally carry in the health service, but that was not identified as a particular need. I think the, um, you know, the sort of broader question of, would, I, I, I don't want to repeat myself, you know, would we have anticipated the lockdown? I, I just don't know the answer to that. I, all I know is that when it came, when the actual debate came in March 2020, there was a lot of uncertainty in our own country about whether it was the right policy response and whether the population would accept it as a policy response. So I, I wonder 10 years in advance whether we, you know, would have resolved those questions. The one thing I'm sure of is, you know, there's no point having a contingency plan you can't pay for. Uh, and absolutely central to all of this is the ability of your economy and your public finances to flex in a crisis. The OBR, uh, mentioned it a few moments ago, it is um, an organisation that, that you implemented during your time in office. Uh, and uh, part of the uh, assistance that it gives to the Treasury is the uh, preparation and presentation of fiscal risk reports. Can you explain to us what those are, please? Well, these and were... Um, so the OBR... Uh, was created very shortly after I came to office. It gave an independent assessment of the public finances. Um, and it's not just, I think it's important for people to understand, it's not just a, another think tank with a sort of another set of finances, uh, sorry, another set of forecasts. These are the government's forecasts. There's not some other set of government forecasts. In other words, the forecasts for GDP, for unemployment, for tax revenues and so on are independently produced, but they are the official government forecasts. And that is the central role of the OBR. And to do that, it is privy to secret information in government. Uh, so it is privy to the budget decisions. I gave eight budgets. It knew what was in the budget weeks before the general public did, or indeed weeks before members of the cabinet would know what was in a budget. So it's a very important institution at the heart of government. And we sought to add to its capability by asking it to undertake um, uh, essentially assessments of potential risks to the yes. UK and what impact they would have Fiscal on the risks. public finance. Well, they were, they were issues like, uh, I think, you know, they looked at everything from a no-deal Brexit to climate change to uh, all sorts of, you know, things that might ha you know, have an impact on the UK and what the fiscal consequences of that would be. So the actual crisis was not a fiscal crisis. It was what was like, going to be the cost, basically, of these various things that they looked at. And there were business as usual risks, as, as they defined, weren't there? And then there were also uh, one-off events recognised and reflected in their risk analysis. And in July of 2017, uh, the um, OBR produced as part of its report this statement, 
On top of the business as usual risks, there could be one-off events that generate demand for additional health spending, such as a large-scale outbreak of disease, for example, uh, an influenza pandemic, which the Cabinet Office considers to represent the most significant civil emergency risk. Long-term systemic cost pressures could also arise from sources such as an increase in antimicrobial resistance. So there was some recognition in the risks that were identified by the OBR of that which is contained in the National Risk Register. Yes, that's right. I think, I mean, I've left office by this point. I, th I think the OBR actually tell us that they had considered doing the influenza uh, scenario planning, but in fact, they switched their resources to looking at a no-deal Brexit um, scenario instead. That's right. Well, my question for you on, on this topic is this. Um, does it surprise you, g given what I've just read out, to know that despite there being uh, an acknowledgement of the influenza pandemic being the most significant emergency risk um, uh, uh, identified by the National Res Risk Register, that it, it, the pandemic, did not appear as a risk on the fiscal list? Well, I think you'd have, I mean, you'd have, I don't know if you're taking evidence from the OBAR uh, oral evidence, but I mean, they, they made their own decisions about what they thought were, part of their independence was to make their own decisions about what they thought they should look at. I imagine the government at the time would not have wanted them to look at a no-deal Brexit scenario, for example. So it's incredibly important they're independent and make those decisions. Um, so you'd have to ask them that question. All right. Well, do you accept, I appreciate you're not in office anymore, but perhaps you will accept from me um, that by July 2021, the OBR had changed its approach to risks, particularly those identified in the National Risk Register, in two ways. Firstly, there was a broader focus in its report mm. of three major risks rather than 97 individual risks. Um, and the, one of those three major risks that is now covered uh, in great detail is, is the risk of, of a pandemic. Uh, and secondly, uh, there appears to be much more joined up thinking now between the risks identified by the OBR, the fiscal risks, and those identified in the National Risk Register. So they have adapted and learned yes. from uh, what happened during the crisis. No, that's absolutely right. And they, I think they specifically in that case are looking at what happens if there's a coronavirus strain that the vaccines aren't work effective against. Um, so y yes, absolutely. But of course, you know, uh, no, look, I would say you know, what it points to is look, try and put in place the right machinery. I, you know, I, I wish this inquiry, you know, every success in trying to anticipate what we could do in the future for um, different crises. But the truth is we're not going to be able to anticipate every crisis that hits the United Kingdom over the rest of our lifetimes. And therefore having, uh, you know, a strong OBR, uh, a, a, you know, a, a treasury with the capacity to come up with quick policy making, uh, central government machinery that can respond quickly to, you know, that is also important, you know, that's also important, as well as trying to anticipate specific crises that you can specifically plan for. Can we put up, please, the witness statement of Sir Mark Walport, which is at INQ 00014707, and go to paragraph 86 at page 33. And, and given what you've just said, Mr Osborne, about the fact that uh, not every eventuality can be predicted or, or planned for, uh, I'd like your view on what uh, Sir Mark says here at paragraph 86. Every national emergency has knock-on effects on citizens' lives mm. beyond the immediate impact of the emergency mm. itself. And there is always the possibility that the cure mm. for the specific emergency, in terms of the policies and actions directed at stemming the primary damage, causes harmful side effects. In the case of a pandemic, lockdowns and quarantining, closing international borders and other restrictions mm. to travel, closing of institutions such as schools and businesses, all have serious adverse consequences. This raises important questions for policymakers about how to balance the direct harms from the pandemic infection against the adverse consequences of interventions, singly mm. or in combination. Th th that statement highlights, does it not, the importance mm. of 
a, a department trying its level best to anticipate not only uh, what's coming down the line, but also what is going to be the effect of the mitigation actions that mm. might have to be taken? I mean, yeah, I mean, this, you know, Mark, I know Mark very well and have worked with him. You know, this goes to my mind, the heart of the, you know, very difficult question that the government of the day had to wrestle with and any future government would have to wrestle with, which is, you know, what is the, what are the, what are the costs and benefits of dealing with the health problem the spread of the disease versus the impact of closing a school. Uh, I had school-aged children at the time of the pandemic. Uh, you know, closing the court system uh, so that people don't get their trial. Uh, you know, um, locking down prisoners in prisons. Uh, you know, all sorts of other things that um, you know had a really yes. damaging impact. And the, you know, the, you go to the heart of very difficult sort of societal questions. Of which, frankly, I don't, you know, you can produce any amount of economic analysis of what's the, you know, benefit of, you know, controlling coronavirus for a day and shutting a school for a day. But I, I think in the end they come down to essentially kind of human societal judgments of what are the things we value. And the truth is, you know, different human beings will value different things. Some people will say the education of the child is more important than, you know, protecting older patients in our, you know, care homes but that that i mean ultimately we have democratic governments that are accountable to the general public in order to try and make those very difficult decisions if this inquiry can help any future government i you know if i'm not sure lady, if i'm allowed to say this but i personally think of this the, your, your inquiry which i strongly support if you can come if you can give some kind of guidance to answering that question it is the single most useful thing this inquiry can do for any future government, which will be faced with very difficult questions uh, like the government was faced in 2020. Are you suggesting, Mr Osborne, w w in the answer that you've just given, that it, it was not worth the Treasury uh, attempting to, to engage in any significant planning well, because the, the decisions have to be made when the, when the pandemic hits? No, I'm, I'm, the, the Treasury did not engage in the planning because no one had anticipated that you would have to or you would have the option of or it would be something you should consider locking well, down the economy right. in order to deal with an asymptomatic non-influenza respiratory a, pandemic. Which is an answer you've already given. And um, may I suggest that had the Treasury been interested uh, in engaging in pre-pandemic planning, then it would have taken a bigger part in the two exercises uh, that took place uh, during your tenure and just after you'd left. Looking at the reports into Exercise Alice uh, that took place in February of 2016, and indeed was an exercise uh, dealing with the outbreak of a coronavirus, the Treasury wasn't even present. In Exercise Cygnus, which was delivered shortly after you left office, but as we know from yesterday, uh, planning for which commenced in 2014, although the Treasury is, is recorded as being present at that exercise, there is no evidence whatsoever of any participation or of any evidence of any lessons to be learned. I, I, is that the sort of action that the Treasury could have taken in order to engage itself with these important exercises looking at what the uh, re result and the reaction of the government would be in the outbreak of these sorts of diseases? Well, I, uh, you know, uh, uh, this is territory that the inquiry has covered and we've covered a bit in the evidence. I think the Treasury was very engaged in drawing up an influenza pandemic plan. I think those exercises were kind of operational exercises in how that plan might actually be put into practice in hospitals and, and other uh, you know, facilities. Um, in which there wouldn't be a sort of particular role at that moment for a Treasury policymaker. The, the Treasury being, as I say, a, a, a department of uh, policymakers rather than the delivery department. So it wouldn't have been directly affected by what the delivery services of government had to do in an influenza pandemic. Um, you know, and there was a general the Treasury had signed off, indeed I had signed off, um, on the 2011 influenza plan in which the Treasury had, as you can see from the material um, in 2009, had assessed the uh, economic costs, had identified a couple of specific issues, but essentially was, you know, said, okay, it's a 3% hit to GDP, but it, we're not, we're not going to have widespread 
sectoral impacts which we need to think of or we're not going to have to design some system to pay people to work from home. Right. Do you agree, Mr Osborne, that by the time that COVID-19 hit, the consequences of austerity were a depleted health and social care capacity and rising inequality in the United Kingdom? Most certainly not. I completely reject that. Um, I, I would make two points. The first of all, it's not surprising that the biggest economic crash that Britain experienced since the 1930s has an impact on Britain and on poverty and on unemployment and on people's life chances. That's unfortunately what happens when your country experiences such a massive economic shock as we experienced in 2008-9. The, the, what flows from that is a whole set of things, and one of them is seriously impaired public finances, which you then have to repair, and that is what we set about doing. Uh, I would say if we had not done that, Britain would have been more exposed, not just to future things like uh, the coronavirus pandemic, but indeed to the fiscal crises, which very rapidly followed in countries across Europe, such as Spain, Italy, Greece, Ireland, Slovenia, all across the continent. Uh, and in indeed, one point, there was a question mark over whether France itself would experience a fiscal crisis. So all across the continent, other countries are experiencing problems of being unable to fund themselves on the international debt market. And as I point out, in the autumn of last year, Britain went through this briefly for a couple of weeks. So this is not some kind of academic problem that doesn't materialize. It's a very real problem. And if we had not had a clear plan to put the public finances on a sustainable path, then Britain might have experienced a fiscal crisis. We would not have had the fiscal space to deal with the coronavirus pandemic when it hit uh, seven years later. And indeed, as Mr. Cameron pointed out yesterday, the example in many of those countries that did have those crises was there were real cuts in health services and other public services right. that went far beyond what uh, the UK experienced. Or in case, in case of the NHS, actually, budgets went up in real terms. Do, do you agree that during your time in office, um, the, um, the state of the social care system um, became worse? I'm not sure I would accept that. I would certainly accept that there are rising pressures, that, including during my period in office, on the social care system. All right. Well, can they I are, ask you to Yeah, but there, they are driven by the fact Britain has a rapidly ageing population. Yes. Oh, uh, not rapid, sorry. Well, a, we'll a, an ageing population so, at a relatively rapid rate. And um, that, uh, you know, the, the cost of medical treatments are going up, All which right. is actually generally a good thing because these are new treatments that uh, can help people. But... You know, the UK social, uh, social care and health system is experiencing exactly the same kinds of pressures as the pressures being experienced in most Western democracies at this moment. Right. Well, let's look at the detail, please. Can we have up on screen INQ 00018967? Now, this is a report by the Institute for Government. Uh, the government think tank whose strapline is inspiring the best in government and working to make government more effective. This is a report um, that was prepared by the authors sitting in the bottom left-hand corner. It's headed, How Fit Were Public Services for Coronavirus? Uh, and we don't need to go to it, but just to set this in context, this is a report based on extensive desk research, analysis of government data, and interviews of civil servants, frontline staff, representative bodies, and other experts. Um, can we go, please, to page eight of this report and highlight the final two paragraphs and zoom in on those? Even before the crisis began, that's the, the COVID crisis, public services had, be, had seen reduced access, longer waiting times, missed targets, rising public dissatisfaction and other signs of declining standards. Most notably, GPs and hospitals were missing almost all routine targets, whilst prisons had experienced a dramatic increase in levels of self-harm, violence and poor prisoner behaviour. This context made it far harder for services to maintain acceptable standards while also mm -hmm. managing a disruption as wide-ranging and long-lasting as that wrought by the coronavirus. The response has also been hampered by historic underinvestment in buildings and equipment. 
Government has consistently underspent its capital budgets, often using money that had been earmarked for long-term investment to cover holes in day-to-day -day budgets. As a result, public services have had to operate out of crumbling prisons, courthouses and hospitals that are difficult to clean or repurpose in line with coronavirus health measures. And can we move down to, to finish this on the following page, please? The sale of courthouses and police stations and the failure to build new prison places have similarly made it harder to maintain social distancing. And inadequate ICT has reduced the ability of police officers and local authority staff to work from home, made it far harder for prisoners confined in cells for more than 23 hours a day to access training or speak to their families, and meant that schools, hospitals, GPs and criminal courts have all struggled at times to provide services remotely, even when greatly reduced. Now, there's reference repeated reference there to prisons and court centres, and indeed those uh, will be covered in detail in later mm. modules. So I just want to, to focus for the moment on what the Institute for Government have found in terms of the state of the health public services and the ability well. for them to react uh, to coronavirus. Is that picture something that you recognise? Um. The short answer is no, because by the time I left office, there were more doctors working in the NHS, more nurses working in the NHS. As Mr Cameron pointed out yesterday, diagnostic testing had increased in the NHS and public satisfaction had remained broadly constant during a difficult period for the economy and uh, for the constraint of spending in public finances. I'd make a general observation. I mean, if you put all this together, the health service, the criminal justice system, the education system, the social care system, I think basically you've just left out defence, but if we had some generals here, they'd no doubt want some more tanks. That is public spending. So you can't, you can't just say, uh, well, we'd like public spending to be higher without then explaining where you're going to get the money from. I've pointed out the risks of borrowing the money, so you can certainly go to the general population and say, please, will you pay more taxes? I would note the present Prime Minister just last year proposed a national insurance rise to pay for the NHS, and it was rejected by his own party and by the opposition. So, in other words, the, you know, this is the job of the Chancellor Exchequer. Right. You are well, going straight to the heart of it, which is you've got to balance all of these competing demands quite so. within public services for different, uh, different services wanting more money, plus the you know, constraints on a country of borrowing the money in international markets, plus the constraints... Uh, on the general population just willing, willy-nilly paying more tax. And the, way you know, the taxpayer you... is also a core participant in that sense to this inquiry, right. I understand which is he's got to pay for all of this. point that you're making, Mr Osborne. And in your witness statement, uh, you claimed that the um, Department of Health funding uh, for the NHS was ring-fenced or, or, or was increased, in fact, year mm. on year during the course of your... Uh, time as Chancellor, whilst other departments were reduced by up to 19 per cent. Yes. Right. Well, I'd like to explore that with you, please. I would make one of, point. That well, was no, also, please, we also... Please just let me ask my question. Of course. I'd like to explore that in terms of social care and in terms of public health, because from the time of the implementation of the Health and Social Care Act of 2012, it's right, isn't it, that... Um, certainly certain of the public health um, responsibilities moved from the National Health Service mm. over to local authorities uh, and therefore came outside of the budget, that part of the budget that the Department of Health mm. would give to the National Health Service. Do you agree with that? Yes. Yes. So um, in terms of, of, of whether or not the, um, the funding for public health had been ring-fenced in the way in which you describe in your witness statement. What we have to, in fact, look at is uh, how the local public um, health was being funded through the local authorities. And in order to do this uh, and to demonstrate my point, can we put up, please, INQ 000 which is the witness statement of Dr. Klaas Kershelly. And can we go to page 70 and paragraph 108? I'd like your comment on, on this, please, once we've read through it, Mr Osborne. 
Functioning, functioning of the new local and national public health structures was compromised by austerity politics. At the local level, the abolition of PCTs uh, meant that overall public health performance was strongly dependent on local authority capabilities to commission and deliver effective services. Ministers had promised to ring-fence the public health budget for local authorities. However, an in-year cut of £200 million in 2015 was followed by further reductions over the next five years. According to the Local Government Association, this amounted to a real-term reduction of the public health grant from over £3.5 billion in 2015 to 16 to just over £3 billion in 2020 to 21, a, 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 a loss of 14%. Other estimates by the Institute for Pop public policy research spoke of an even more dramatic reduction from 850 million in net expenditure between 2014-15 and 2019-20 with the poorest areas in England experiencing disproportionately high cuts of almost 15% Resulting pressures on local public health were exacerbated by an overall 49% real-term cut in central fund government funding for local authorities between 2010-11 and 2016-17, and a resulting practice of top slicing, whereby authorities reallocated ring-fenced public health budgets to other services broadly impacting health and well-being, such as trading standards or parks and green spaces. In 2010, Healthy lives, healthy people had promised to give local government the freedom, responsibility uh, and funding to innovate and develop their own ways of improving public health in their area. Freedom and responsibility had been granted, but funding was often lacking. What do you say about that, Mr Osborne? Well, there are several things I'd say about this. I mean, first of all, um, I think it's universally accepted that the decision, which was not mine, it was taken elsewhere in the government, but the decision to transfer public health from the NHS to local authorities has turned out to be, broadly speaking, a good thing. There is no one, as far as I'm aware, arguing that it should be returned to the N NHS. What about the funding position? Well, we'll come on to the funding position, but, you know, the central, because this is, a, you know, also helps address the funding point. So, first of all, that was an important decision, and it meant that public health decisions were tied in with other decisions that local government takes around housing and, uh, and the like, licensing, recreation facilities, uh, and so on. Um, second, as it happens during the period I was Chancellor, the public health budget went up. You, you, the, the numbers you refer to are from 2015 to 2020. I yes. left office shortly after 2015. Um, but I would make a broader point, which is, you know, here there's a kind of challenge, which is a, a classic policy-making challenge of to what extent do you try and ring-fence things and say local authorities must spend this money on this particular thing. Uh, indeed, public inquiries of all kinds have generally led to conclusions that budgets should be ring-fenced for the thing the public inquiry was looking at. Yes. And then over time, a local authority has less and less discretion about how to spend money because this bit's ring-fenced, that bit's ring-fenced, and so on. And you either, you may, A, erode local decision-making and local democracy, uh, and you also end up with a whole load of siloed uh, individual ring fences. So as a government, the Cameron government, of which I was an active part, was actually promoting localism, and, we, and indeed we went further in devolving power, such as indeed the NHS and public health and social services in Manchester to the Greater Manchester Authority. We've but created. to work, the, the system yeah, has so, to be properly funded, doesn't well, it? Well, then you, then you come to the point which is, and by the way, local government has its own resources. It can raise or cut local taxes. Uh, has, part of the taxation system is in the hands of local government. But I would make a, you know, then I make the point, first of all, Money is not the solution to all public health problems. I introduced a sugar tax, which has, I believe, had a big impact on reducing sugary drinks and uh, helping with obesity levels in the UK. Smoking uh, uh, during the Cameron government uh, reduced as a uh, uh, quite dramatically the, uh, the amount of the population, the proportion of the population smoking. So you can do all sorts of other things to help with public health. If you're coming back, back to like the public health budget. Well then, that's you know, what, that's what okay. The well then, then, was. then, you know that that which straddles several different parts of government uh, again comes into the general question you've got of which budgets you're going to cut, or what money you're going to borrow, or what taxes you're going to put up. Right. And we had can, made can a I... decision to uh, ring fence the NHS and indeed to ring fence some of these public health grants. 
Um, uh, by the way, I might just observe that Public Health England, um, which we created, was absolutely instrumental in coming up, I think, within three days for a test with coronavirus. So we did put in place structures that in 2020 did deliver uh, in the case of developing a very rapid test which was required for this brand new disease. Well, I'm going to suggest, uh, Mr Osborne, that Public Health England failed in its mission to um, increase the country's public health. You will know that uh, your Secretary of State for Health and then Health and Social Care, Jeremy Hunt, has provided a witness statement to the inquiry in which he says that he acknowledges that during his time as Secretary of State, the NHS required more funding. There was, as you have already acknowledged, a rapidly rising demand for services, an ageing population, that, that he considered that there were staffing capacities uh, within the system that um, w were causing difficulties, uh, and that the NHS workforce requirements, which have historically been considered in an ad hoc way, need to be sorted out in order for the uh, National Health Service to, to properly support uh, the capacity that's required. Uh, and that, that's in, in normal circumstances. But when one takes that into account when the pandemic hit, mm. uh, do you accept his criticisms that the system was not working uh, as properly as it should be? And that part of the reason for that must have been the funding. Well, I, I, I read his evidence, which I thought was very good and had some interesting and constructive ideas for the future around uh, testing capabilities and so on, um, and lessons to be learned from South Korea and Taiwan and other countries. Um, I think, from memory, he actually identifies Brexit and immigration as one of the problems that the health service had relied on a stream of people coming into the country to fill uh, posts in nursing and uh, you know, other parts of the medical profession, and that you know proved problematic during the period. Um, he was health secretary. You, I, I had by then left the government. All right. Do you agree that, um, h however well funded you say the NHS was during your time as chancellor, it, it simply wasn't enough? No, I don't accept that. I mean, what I accept is you could spend more money on the NHS, just like you could spend more money on the court system, more money on the school system, more money on the army. Um, but you have to make a calculation of you know, balancing the resources each of those services get the, and, the resource, and the central calculation, which every, every, every household has to make, is what can we actually afford? Because what can we, what's, what's the revenue that's coming in? Um, and so I think, you know, we prioritised uh, health. I would also, you know, it's not insignificant, this, that at the 2010 general election, this is exactly what we said we were going to do, cut other areas but increase health. Very, uh, we went into the general election telling the public we were going to cut uh, those other services. And in 2015, we also said the same thing. And on both cases, you know, the public put their confidence in us. So in terms of also democratic accountability, I don't think the public were misled about what the government would do. Um, and the evidence of the 2015 election were prepared to continue to place their trust in us. Can we display, please, INQ 0001 119293? This is the OBR's first fiscal risk report from July of 2017. I've already made reference to it. And can we go to paragraph 162 and look at, sorry, page 162, and look at paragraphs 6.66 and 6.67. This was the risk report provided a year mm -hmm. after you had left office. Uh, and if we can look, please, at, in fact, 6.66, we will start with. Thank you very much. It's headed pressures on the adult social care budget and how government has responded. As with health, there are visible signs of pressure on the adult social care system. In the past two years, governments have announced top-up funding and delayed reforms that would increase costs further. The government has stated that... Further reform is required to ensure that the system is prepared to meet the challenges of the increasing numbers of over 75s and that it will work with partners at all levels, including those who use services and who work to provide care to bring forward proposals for public consultation. Signs and sources of pressure on the adult social care budget include pressure on local authority budgets has fed through to adult social care. 
For those authorities in England with responsibility for adult social care, it is their largest item of discretionary spending. Local authority budgets have been squeezed by cuts to grant funding and limits on council tax rises. As a result, English local authorities' total net current expenditure fell by 13.3% in real terms between 2010 to 11 and 2015 to 16. Within this, total spending on adult social care fell by less, but local authority spending on it still fell by 9.1% over the same period, including transfers from the NHS. Spending on adult and children's social care exceeded local authorities' budgets in 2014 to 15, and by a bigger margin of 2015 to 16. Now, this is the organisation that you created telling us here mm. uh, that um, so far as local authority budgets are concerned uh, and adult social care is concerned, uh, the picture uh, was not great. Do you well, agree? I'm, not, I, um, I'm not saying, I'm sure it does say that, to be honest. I, I mean, I think it points out that there are pressures on the adult social care system. That's a statement of the obvious in all uh, advanced democracies at the moment. And then it goes to point out that there were reductions in the local government budget. Yes, there were. We've we announced they weren't they're not like secret reductions in the local government budget. They were publicly announced as part of a program of trying to reduce government expenditure. But if you exclude uh, local government, education, defence, criminal justice, and the NHS, you haven't got anything left. That is what public expenditure is, plus welfare spending, which uh, you know people also are not keen on having redu reduced. So welfare entitlements. So. Yes, there were reductions in local government budgets. That's because the country had had an enormous financial crash, was poorer than it had been before, was going to be permanently poorer. There was an impact on it. You know, its, its permanent potential had been impacted by the uh, crash. And we had to try and make sure that public expenditure fitted the size of the economy, whilst getting the economy growing and putting people into work and reducing poverty, which all happened uh, under our watch as well. So we got the economy going so that you could afford to spend ultimately more on those things. I would just say on social care, it's really straightforward. There are two people who can pay for social care. The taxpayer can pay, and then you've got to be prepared for higher levels of general taxation. Rishi Sunak's NHS and social care levy was rejected by the Conservative Party and the Labour Party in the last year. Or you can ask people to sell their homes, the assets they have, to pay for that social care. There's no one else who's going to pay for it, the taxpayer or the individual. And the political system for 20 years under governments of all colours have rejected those two options, which is why you continually read that there's an ongoing uh, you know, debate about what the, the social care problem is unsolved. That's because the solutions are currently unpalatable to the political system, which I would suggest is a reflection of being unpalatable to the broader taxpayer and society. But, but what about the effect of... The, the falling expenditure. You know that last week the inquiry has heard from Professors Marmot and Bambra, who told the inquiry mm. that changes in the social determinants of health because of austerity since 2010 mm. were likely to be the causes of the adverse changes in health and health inequalities in the UK. And also, I know that you've had sight of the statement of Professor mm. Kevin Fenton, the President of the United mm. Kingdom Faculty of Public Health, who's told the inquiry that a key lesson learned through the pandemic has been the importance of robust engagement with potentially disproportionately affected populations, both in the planning and preparedness. What I want you yeah, to consider, I mean, well, Mr I mean, Osborne, is firstly uh, that government policy had an effect on health and social care, which meant that those in the worst situations of society were disproportionately affected when COVID hit. And secondly, that that was identifiable, it was predictable, and it should have been part of the government planning. I just completely reject that. And you know, in the case of the Marmot and Bamber report, you know, and obviously they, there's a lot of very interesting work on health inequalities, which we did a huge amount to seek to address. They have this statement of paragraph 151. National economic wealth, i.e. GDP, has long been considered as the major global determinant of population health. Of course. In other words, ha that's what happened. Britain had a huge economic crash, the greatest since the 1920s and 30s Great Depression. 
And of course that it had an impact on poverty in the country. It would have been worse, in my view, and in the view of many other people, including the Governor of the Bank of England at the time, Mervyn King, had we not then also tried to address the, the risk to the public finances, because that would have led to a fiscal crisis, like you saw across much of Europe, that would have meant even less funding for these uh, public services. We tried to protect the health service during that austerity program. And I, you know, Marmot and Bamba themselves say that they, don't, they can't directly establish causality between austerity and the mortality rates they look at. And the only example I can find in their report of a country that they cite that has a stimulus program is Iceland, which, by the way, has a population about the size of the borough that this courthouse is in, right? And then even in the same paragraph, go on to point out that Iceland had some severe health effects from the crisis. Uh, and they leave out the United States, which was the primary example of a country in the West that tried a stimulus program as opposed to an austerity program, because they say, oh, yes, well, actually, mortality fell there. I've even done my own research and found out that mortality fell in Germany for the poorest population, part of the population during the period I was chancellor. And I don't think anyone thinks that Germany pursued a particularly tough austerity program during that period. So I just, so, so you, I, I you, just reject all right, the... I, I they, and, and I just reject... I, I, I would centre on their central conclusion which is national economic wealth has long been considered as the major global determinant of population health. So, yes. so your evidence, Mr Osborne, is that although you acknowledge that in certain aspects the effects of COVID were felt more keenly by those most disadvantaged in society, that uh, has no connection whatsoever to the effects of austerity that, that were brought in in 2010. That's absolutely my contention. Right. It is true that pandemics will, will affect poorer people yes. more severely, and that is one of the great tragedies, which is why we try to try and alleviate poverty and direct services towards them. I think everything we did to try and ring fence the NHS budget, to provide stable finances so that they were not further affected by a fiscal crisis, uh, things like universal credit, which were introduced, all of these things were done to try and protect the poorest part of the population. Indeed, I was the first chancellor ever to publish distributional analysis of the effect of my policies of budget after budget, precisely to show that we were trying to direct resources in constrained times to the poorest yes, and most vulnerable, right. who are indeed generally more exposed to things like pandemics, tragically. Mr. Osborne, Mr. Michael, thank um, you. how are we doing? Because I think, if I may say so, Mr. Osborne and I share a tendency which is to speak very fast. <laughs> um, and the stenographer, I'm afraid, has had a, a, a tough morning, so... I, I only have two more You think you can um, finish by questions. one o'clock? Yes, I will finish by one o'clock. Okay. Can I apologise to you, my lady, for talking too quickly for the uh, stenographer? Don't, don't worry, I do it too, so I'm afraid <laughs> we're in the same camp. T two final questions, please. The first, going back to mm. health economics, mm. and I'd like to put to you... Uh, the statement made by Professor Sir Chris Whitty in his witness statement, we don't need to put it up, but, but he has told the inquiry this. There may be a need to look at operational issues and the cost effectiveness of particular interventions within CMO or SAGE advice. So health economics may be relevant to the medical and scientific advice. This is because giving advice which is operationally unfeasible or substantially disproportionate in cost or difficulty is not especially helpful. And, and that is mirrored and expanded by uh, the witness statement of Professor John Edmonds from the Department of Infectious Disease Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And he says this... There needs to be far greater attention paid to the economic impact of pandemics and the interventions aimed at controlling them. Oh, thank you very much. It's on the screen. The economics of outbreaks is a specialised field. Interventions can have major knock-on effects so that individuals who are not directly reached or targeted by the intervention can still benefit as they have a reduced risk of infection from others. These knock-on effects need to be incorporated into the analysis to avoid underestimating the benefits of public health actions. Just pausing there, do you agree uh, with these two scientific experts that there needs to be joined up thinking between the science mm. and the economy? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I mean, the, but I would observe that you know, if you're trying to 
think through how a future government might deal with yes. a, a pandemic. It's not just the health impacts. You know, you have to, what I think the government wrestled with at the time, I wasn't in it, but I can see as an external observer and with my experience, was also the educational impacts, the criminal justice impacts and the like of, of the lockdown. And trying to balance those, if you can apply more, and indeed the you know impact on businesses and you know, people's um, employment, if you know trying to, you can certainly apply more analysis to all of that. I personally think you're going to end up with a very different, difficult, essentially sort of human judgment of are you valuing education over health. Um, in some cases, you know, and that is a very, very, or, and other examples like that. And that's an incredibly hard trade-off, which I, I guess we have, you know, in our country, elected governments to try and make on our behalf. All right, thank you. But finally, let's just look at the consequences of, of failing to plan. And can we display, please, INQ 00008720 5 and look at paragraph 16 at page four of the Pandemic Diseases Capabilities Board uh, review of April 2022. <coughs> Paragraph 16, please. In line with the National Security Risk Assessment methodology, Revised pandemic reasonable worst case scenario models represent unmitigated scenarios and so do not include a full risk assessment for the use of NPIs, non-pharmaceutical interventions. Given that the imposition of lockdown in part accounted for a 25% drop in GDP between February and April 2020, the largest drop on record, and numerous secondary and tertiary impacts on all sectors. This represents a significant gap in the UK's assessment of pandemic risk. Noting that even without government intervention, we would anticipate spontaneous behaviour change and subsequent economic damage. What is more, the secondary and tertiary impact of these measures will have been unevenly spread throughout society, highlighting and in areas exacerbating pre-existing inequalities. Now, can we go to page five and paragraph 18? And can we highlight 18, 19 and 20, please? The unpre unprecedented use of NPIs and significant changes in public behaviour seen during the COVID-19 pandemic mm. required the provision of far greater economic support than pre-COVID planning assumptions suggested. The planning assumptions in the 2011 UK influenza pandemic preparedness strategy focused on the economic impacts of sickness absences. As a result, the strategy did not include many of the significant economic impacts which we have seen during this pandemic, such as the dramatic drops in economic activity, significant shifts and reductions in consumer spending, and disruption to global supply chains. The OBR's fiscal risks report from July 2021, which we've looked at, suggests the United Kingdom's real GDP declined by an unprecedented 9.8% in 2020, and as of September 2021, the NAO estimated the lifetime cost of government spending on COVID-19 will reach 370 billion. <coughs> Clearly then, in line with recommended, mm. recommendation 2.1, our economic risk assessment for pandemics must be updated to include a broader range of impacts, including the significant potential impacts of MPIs and behavioural changes on different sectors of the economy. Do you agree with that conclusion, Mr Osborne? Well, I do. I absolutely agree with the conclusion. I, I, knowing the brilliant civil servants of the Treasury, I suspect they've already done it for you. There already will be a load of internal assessments of the future effect of, for example, coronavirus um, variations that don't have uh, vaccines at the moment that are effective, were they to emerge. Yes. Um, but I would make, you know, I would, I guess my sort of, I, 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 where we started with this was, did the Treasury or indeed any other government, part of government or indeed any other 
Western government anticipate that it might require a lockdown that would impact the economy, as it says here, by a drop of 25 per cent of GDP? No, they didn't. But we, through the program we pursued as a government, we created the fiscal space so we could end up spending £370 billion to help people uh, deal with all the uh, adverse effects that the lockdown introduced in terms of um, their education, their the way the criminal justice system worked, and above all, their employment. And we kept people uh, as a country uh, economically in a much better shape than they would have been if we had not been able to spend that money. And that's because we created the fiscal space. It meant we avoided the banking crisis, and we did that because of the reforms that happened during the period that I was in government, uh, and uh, as a result of the determined effort to fix the roof. I'm sure that um, in subsequent modules, the inquiry will be told whether or not these plans are indeed now uh, in practice. Uh, but if that's right, Mr Osborne, it's a shame that this wasn't done before, isn't it? Well, I would just point out no one I'm aware of anywhere in the Western world, maybe anywhere, else, anywhere in the world, said you know what governments should prepare for? They should prepare for a coronavirus pandemic that will require us to lock down the entire economy for months on end. Obviously, if someone had said that, then there would be a legitimate question, which is, why aren't you preparing for it? But I'm, unfortunately, no one did. And it's, as I say in my own evidence, uh, I, I, of course, dearly wish they had. My lady, that concludes my questioning of this witness. Uh, there are no Rule 9 requests by any other court participant. It's now 1 o'clock. Would you like to rise, please? I will indeed. Um, I should come back at two. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Osborne, and I'm glad we could complete before lunch. Thank you. All right.